now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Well, a comedy Sunday edition of the program here uh, with uh, Jack Benny, Abbott and Costello, The Halls of Ivy, People Are Funny, and Lum and Abner. That's all straight ahead on this Sunday, 17th day of March. This is St. Patty's Day, the 77th day of the year, 289 days until we get to 2025. St. Patrick's Day celebrated in New York City for the first time on this date in 1756. In 1776, British forces evacuated Boston after George Washington and Henry Knox placed artillery overlooking the city. The rubber band patented on this date in 1845. And in 1901, a showing of 71 Vincent van Gogh paintings in Paris, 11 years after his death, created a sensation. Uh, Luther Gulick and his wife Charlotte founded the Campfire Girls on this date in 1910. Nevada legalized gambling on this date in 1931. In Washington on this date in 1941, the National Gallery of Art officially opened by President Roosevelt. In 1948, Benelux France and the UK signed the Treaty of Brussels, a precursor to the NATO agreement. In 1950, the University of California Berkeley researchers announced the creation of Element 98 in 1950, which they named California. 1958, the U.S. launched the Vanguard 1 satellite. And in 1960, President Eisenhower signed the National Security Council Directive on the Anti-Cuban Covert Action Program that would ultimately lead to the Bay of Pigs. Off the coast of Spain in the Mediterranean on this date in 1966, the Alvin submarine found a missing American hydrogen bomb. Oops. What was later determined to be a stuck thruster led to the premature termination of the Gemini's 8 space mission to dock with an unmanned vehicle in orbit on this date in 1966. Did he say he could not turn the Agena off? No, he... Say again? Uh, in a pile of left wall here. The gate split and blown them, but they can't seem to stop it or get them working. The flight was terminated hours later, and Gemini 8 landed three days early. The crew would fly again and make it to the moon. Pilot David R. Scott would be the seventh man to land on the moon. And the command pilot, you know his story well. The first man to set the foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong. In 1969, Golda Meir became the first female prime minister of Israel. 1970, the Army charged 14 officers with suppressing information related to the My Lai Massacre. In his address before the U.N. General Assembly on this date in 1977, Jimmy Carter laid out his plans for advancing the cause of human rights. The basic thrust of human affairs points toward a more universal demand for fundamental human rights. The United States has a historical birthright to be associated with this process. I will seek congressional approval and sign the UN covenants on economic, social, and cultural rights and the covenants on civil and political rights. And I will work closely with our own Congress in seeking to support the ratification, not only of these two instruments, but the United Nations Genocide Convention and the Treaty for the Elimination of all forms of racial discrimination as well. In 2002, Carter awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the Carter Center in partnership with Emory University. Some historians believe that was more of an accomplishment than anything he did during his presidency. In 1985, serial killer Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, committed his first two murders in Los Angeles. Uh, In 2003, British Cabinet Minister Robin Cook resigned over government plans for war with Iraq. At the same time, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan ordered staff to leave Iraq. We will withdraw the Onmovic and Atomic Agency inspectors. We will withdraw the UN humanitarian uh, workers. 
we will withdraw the Unicom uh, troops on the Iraq-Kuwaiti border. Anand also said the UN-administered oil for food program in Iraq would be suspended during the withdrawal since oil monitors would not be on the ground to run the exchange of Iraqi-produced oil for humanitarian supplies. Unrest in Kosovo resulted in more than 22 killed, 200 wounded, and the destruction of 35 Serbian Orthodox shrines in Kosovo and two mosques in Belgrade and Niz on this date in 2004. In 2006, a Dutch autopsy on Slobodan Milosevic, the former Yugoslav president who was found dead in his cell just six days earlier, detected no evidence of any toxin, non-prescribed medications, or even abnormal level of his prescribed medications. So far, no indications of poisoning have been found. U.N. War Crimes Tribunal President Fausto Pokar saying that the autopsy had already disclosed two underlying heart conditions that Slobodan Milosevic suffered from. A Russian heart specialist told reporters Mr. Milosevic had died from undetected blockages in his coronary arteries. In 1999, Milosevic was charged by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, with war crimes including genocide and crimes against humanity in connection with the wars in Bosnia, Croatia, and Kosovo. And in 2008, rock musician Paul McCartney's divorce from Heather Mills settled for $48.6 million. Among those passing away on this date in history, St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, Daniel Bernoulli, the Dutch-born mathematician, physician mathematician Christian Doppler, uh, Fred Allen passing away on this date, a very sad passing on this date in 1956. Actress Grace Stafford, actress Helen Hayes, singer Terry Stafford, Spiders and Snakes, uh, broadcast executive Pat Weber, TV personality J.J. Jackson, fashion designer Oleg Cassini, and country singer Ferlin Husky, all passing away on this date in history. Birth dates of those who are no longer with us, golfer Bobby Jones, also singer Ray Ellington, singer Nat King Cole, unforgettable, uh, astronaut James Irwin, uh, the first African-American game show host of the show Musical Chairs, Adam Wade, uh, born on this date, another astronaut, Ken Mattingly, who passed away just this last year at the age of 87, also uh, dancer-choreographer Rudolf Nureyev, uh, Jefferson Airplane's Paul Kentner and serial killer John Wayne Gacy, all born on this date in history. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Uh, he was originally in The Loving Spoonful, but best known as a solo artist for his theme song from Welcome Back, Cotter, John Sebastian, 80 years old today. From Dallas and step-by-step, step, Patrick Duffy, 75. Actor Kurt Russell is 73. Probably best known for CSI, but I remember him well from the adaptation, the original adaptation of Stephen King's The Stand, Gary Sinise, 69. Actor Rob Lowe is 60. Uh, from the Smashing Pumpkins, the owner of the National Wrestling Alliance, Billy Corgan is 57. From Justified and the Detour, Natalie Zia is 49. From Sweet Valley High and the Game, Brittany Daniel, 48. Her uh, sister, also from Sweet Valley High, uh, now better known as a photographer, Cynthia Daniel, also 48. Pro wrestler Samoa Joe, uh, as of uh, this recording, the uh, AEW heavyweight champion, 45. Mrs. Ice T, Coco Austin, 45. Another high school musical alum, Olestra Rulin, is 38. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the 17th day of March as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday. Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. 
And we get rolling here on this uh, Sunday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox with a man who made Sunday an institution for his show, Jack Benny, from 84 years ago, March 17th, 1940. Yes, I know we did Jack yesterday, but I couldn't resist playing this today. Uh, Orson Welles uh, in a uh, dramatic coaching position as Jack goes to try out for the Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's next. Ladies and gentlemen, make tomorrow your D-Day. Get an extra bond for defense. Step into any bank or post office and buy yourself a profitable share in America's future. As an investment, bonds are better than ever. They can help you save safely, conveniently, and profitably. So whether you already buy on the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank, get an extra bond for defense tomorrow. Before we get started, I want to say two things. First, I want to thank Richard for buying me a copy over at ClassicRadio.Stream. Uh, we appreciate anybody who does that. A lot of you have done it, and Richard, we appreciate you doing it. Uh, if you want to help this program, show your appreciation, go to ClassicRadio.Stream. ClassicRadio.Stream. Buy me a copy or two. That would be greatly appreciated. There's also some items for purchase there. And if you buy those, that would help uh, support this program as well. And uh, I also want to mention that there are other, there's other information there that I hope you will peruse, including our social media links. Uh, ClassicRadio.Stream. Tomorrow on the show, we are going to have Crime with Casey Crime Photographer, Dangerous Assignment, I was a communist for the FBI, Nick Carter, private detective, and the Weird Circle. That's all coming up on our Monday program. But let's kick off our Sunday run of shows here by starting off with Jack Benny, when it was still the Jell-O show from 84 years ago, March 17th, 1940. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Night After Night. Everything from soup to jello. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the best way I know to describe a really complete meal. For jello adds to any table that grand final touch of pleasure and perfection. Its rich glowing color is a tempting invitation to pick up that spoon and start right in on this swell, inviting dessert. And just to taste it is to know the ultimate in good things to eat. Yes, there's nothing more attractive than a bright, shimmering mold of delicious Jell-O. And there's certainly nothing more delightful than Jell-O's rare, distinctive flavor, as enticing and refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. So friends, make that next meal really complete by topping it off with a top-notch Jell-O dessert made with any of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. Ask your grocer for several packages of Jell-O tomorrow. And when you buy, look for those big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, and Jell-O spells a treat. That was night after night played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies. A man hold who... Hold it, Don, Don, hold it, hold it. Jack isn't here yet. Well, where is he? Well, he's out in the hall talking to Orson Welles on the telephone. You mean Orson Welles, the famous actor? Yeah. What's he talking to him about? Well, it's a long story. Jack is still burned up because he didn't win the Academy Award this year. So from now on, he's going in for heavy dramatic stuff. And right now, he's out there trying to get Orson Welles to coach him. Ain't that a Lulu? But gee, Mr. <laughs> Benny's a comedian. <laughs> What does he want dramatic lessons for? Well, that's what I say. He ought to stick to them big shoes and baggy pants. <laughs> but I guess I better go out in the hall and get him. Yeah, tell him to make it snappy. We're on the air. Okay. Uh, yes, I understand, Orson. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite. Oh, but definitely. Uh, very well, Orson. I shall be expecting you within the hour. Hey, Jackson, we're waiting for you. I'll be there in a moment, Phil, old boy. Uh, by the way, Orson, shall I send my car for you Or will you take a car? I mean cab <laughs> Oh, very well, I shall be looking forward to your visit Thanks very much 
uh, goodbye. Well, that's that. Say, uh, kind of putting on the dog there, wasn't you? Phil, don't say wasn't you. It hurts my ear. Well, get a load of him. He talks to Orson Welles for two minutes and my English ain't good enough for him. And don't say ain't. Heavens. Oh, stop with that highbrow stuff. What are you trying to do? Make me feel subconscious? <laughs> That's self-conscious. And listen, Phil, when Orson Welles gets here, will you do me a favor and talk just with your hands? <laughs> I'll tell him you've got laryngitis. Come on, let's go inside. Yes, let's join the others. Pip, pip. <laughs> Gee, you're funny. You know, Phil, it's amazing that you haven't got your own program. Well, I may have one of these days. I often dream about my own show. Oh, you do? Well, maybe I can arrange for the Sandman to tear up your option and sprinkle it on you. <laughs> Come on, subconscious. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Don. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, it's all right, Jack. Uh, shall I go ahead now with your introduction? Oh, don't bother. Let it go tonight. Well, no build-up for the star, huh? It isn't necessary, Phil. I think I'm fairly well-known, don't you? You're Don Tootin. Everybody knows you, Mr. Benny. Why, your name is famous from coast to coast. Well, thanks, Dennis. That kid will work next year. <laughs> That's not flattery, Phil. I've been in show business for a long time, and naturally, my name has become more or less familiar. Well, let me tell you something, Jackson. When I go out on the road with my band, I hit a lot of towns where they never even heard of you. No kidding. That's a fact. Well, Phil, in the kind of towns you play, you can get eight to one that shoes are a passing fancy. <laughs> you never played a town yet where you didn't have to get off a train and get on a bus... Get off the bus and get on a horse. Get off the horse and crawl through the brush. <laughs> you're not an entertainer. You're an explorer. Uh, say, Don. Yes, Jack? I meant to tell you, I just spoke to Orson Welles on the phone, and he's coming over in a little while. Oh, yes. Uh, Phil mentioned something about it. He said you wanted Mr. Welles to coach you in dramatics. Yes, and he has consented to help me out. Gee, Mr. Benny, you're a swell actor now. You don't need any coaching. Yes, I do, Dennis. That's right. Don't change your mind so fast. <laughs> You know, Don, I've been doing comedy for a long time in radio and pictures, and, oh, comedy is all right, but I've decided to go in for deeper things. Uh, now, Dennis. Yes, please? Uh, Mr. Uh, Wells will be here pretty soon, so I think you ought to get your song over with. Have you got something ready? Yes, Mr. Benny. This being St. Patrick's Day, I'm going to sing a real old Irish folk song called Phil the Fluter. Well, that's very apropos. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. Say, uh, Jack, I forgot to ask you, how's Mary getting along? Mary? Oh, she's much better, Don, but she'll have to stay in bed a couple more days. Well, I'm very glad she's improving. Hey, what's the matter with Mary? Oh, she had a bad... Uh, Dennis, you can close your mouth. We're going to talk for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh... She had a bad cold, Phil. I think it was a touch of the flu, but she's getting along fine. Has Mary got a nurse? Yes, Phil, and she's gorgeous. Well, all right. <laughs> and her husband, who was six feet four and could break you right in two, isn't bad looking either. Sing, Dennis. I think there'll be no more interruptions. <laughs> Have you heard of Phil the Fluter of the town of Ballymuck? The times were going hard with him, in fact the man was broke So he just sent out a notice to his neighbors one and all As how he liked their company that evening at a ball And when right now he was careful to suggest to them If they found a hat of his convenient to the door The more they put in Whenever he requested them, the better would the music be for dancing on the floor. With the toot of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle, oh, hopping in the middle like a heron on the griddle, oh, up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety of Phil the Fluter's ball? Then little Mickey Mulligan got up to show them how And then the widow Cafferty stepped out and makes her bow I could dance you off your legs as she as sure as you were born If you'll only make the piper play if a hair was in the corn So Phil plays up to the best of his ability The lady and the gentleman begin to do their share Faith and Mick, it's you that has agility Because of Mrs. Cafferty, you're leaping like a hare With the toot of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle low oh, Hopping in the middle like a heron on the griddle low oh, Up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall 
Oh, hadn't we the gaiety at Phil the Fluter's ball? Then Phil the Fluter tipped a wink to little Crooked Pat. I think it's nearly time to see for passing round the hat. So Patty passed the hat around and looking mighty cute. Says, you've got to pay the piper when he tutors on the flute. Then all joined in with the greatest joviality, covering the buckle and the shuffle and the cut. Jig Swapper danced of the very finest quality, but the widow beat the company at handle in the foot. With the toot of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle, oh, up and in the middle like a heron on the griddle, oh, up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety that filled the fluter's ball? was uh, Phil the Fluter, sung by Dennis Day, a real Irishman. You know, Dennis, it's a funny thing, but you're the only Irishman I ever met that I can lick. Don't be too sure about that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I picked the wrong day, folks. Huh? <laughs> Say, I wonder what's keeping Orson. He ought to be here pretty soon. Well, Jack, you must remember that Mr. Wells is a very busy man. Between his radio program and directing plenty to do. Oh, I know he has a heavy schedule. In fact, I don't know how he'll ever find time to come over here and help you out. Well, you see, Don, he and I are old friends. We went to high school together. High school together? Why, Orson Welles is only 24 years old. Phil, he graduated from high school at the age of five. Don't you read the magazine? <laughs> why, why, when he was seven, he played Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, and the beard was his own. <laughs> so don't tell me about Orson Welles. Pretty smart youngster, huh? Smart? Don, if you could have seen him in that high chair in front of the class doing his geometry lessons on his bib. <laughs> well, it was simply phenomenal. Is he going to teach you geometry, Mr. Benny? Uh, no, Dennis. He's coming over to coach me in dramatic art. And I'll tell you one thing, fellas. With his technique and my feeling for the finer things, who knows what results I can attain? Who knows where I can go? Oh, boy, if Mary was only here. <laughs> Never mind, Phil. I'm quite serious. Anyway, when Orson gets... Oh, gosh, that must be him. Come in. Pardon me. Has Mr. Wells arrived yet? No, not yet. I'm his secretary, Miss Wentworth. If you don't mind, I'll wait for him. Oh, no, no, no. Come right in. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Harris, will you please show Miss Wentworth to a chair? Sure, park the chassis here, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, uh, make yourself uh, comfortable, Miss Wentworth. Now, as I was saying, fellas, when Mr. Wells gets here, I don't want any heckling. Just behave yourselves while we're rehearsing. Well, what do you intend doing tonight, Jack? Uh, goodbye, Mr. Chips? Oh, no, Don. We're going to work up to that gradually. First, he's going to teach me dramatic delivery and enunciation and how to breathe. Isn't that right, Miss Wentworth? I can hear you breathing way over here. <laughs> I mean correctly. <laughs> you know, fellas, there's a way of breathing when you read lines that... Oh, pardon me. Hello? Mr. Wells? Oh, he hasn't arrived yet, but... Uh, I'll have him call you. Goodbye. Well. Who was that, Mr. Benny? It was, oh, darn it, I was so excited I forgot to ask. Well, you're a fine secretary. You're the secretary, not me. <laughs> then why did you answer the phone? Because it's my phone, that's why. I forgot to ask the man's name, so what? Mr. Wells won't like it. <laughs> Look, miss, don't worry about that. The party will probably call back again. And when they do, I'll be... Come in. Excuse me, is this Studio B... Yes, sir. I was to meet Mr. Wells here. I'm Mr. Stone, his secretary. His secretary? Then who's Miss Wentworth? She's his private secretary. I am right out in the open. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, uh, come right in. Mr. Wells should be here any moment. Thank you. How do you do, Miss Wentworth? Good evening, Mr. Stone. Hmm. Gee, that Orson's a pretty busy guy, ain't he? Phil, I warned you about saying ain't. Oh, that's right. He's a pretty busy guy. Am he not? <laughs> Just let it go, Phil. Now, Don, I wish that Mr. you and Stone, Dennis... here's a script the Theater Guild sent from New York. Thank you. And by the way, there was a phone call from Mr. Wells, but Mr. Benny failed to get the name. Oh, that's terrible. I said I was excited and I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Mr. Wells won't like it. Nuts to Mr. Wells! <laughs> <laughs> Gee, you'd think I'd murdered somebody. Now, Don, as I was saying, if you and Dennis would be... Now what? Come in. Pardon me, I'm looking for Studio B. I have an appointment. If he isn't here yet, have a seat. Good evening, Mr. Wells. Good evening, Mr. Wells. Good evening, Mr. Wells. Oh, Orson! <laughs> Come right in! <laughs> oh, 
gosh, I didn't know there for a minute. I, well, I'm glad you were able to make it, Orson. I was wondering if you were Mr. going to... Mr. Stone, did Gabriel send in those sketches? The costumes for the picture will be needing them soon, you know. Yes, Mr. Wells, and I received that script from the theater girl. Good, good. Let me see it. Here you are, sir. Hmm, it looks like a very interesting play. <laughs> However, to finish the second act, we'll need polishing. Gee. Oh, Orson, before we get started, I'd like to have you meet some of the members. Miss Wentworth, did you cable Mr. Miller about the American rights to his new production, the one that opened last week in London? Yes, I did, Mr. Wells. And by the way, just before you arrived, a phone call came for you. But Mr. Benny didn't get the name. Snitcher. <laughs> I was excited, Orson. That's all right, Jack, but watch those things in the future. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I, I will, I will, yeah Now, uh, Orson, before we get started I'd like to have you meet the members of my cast This is our announcer, Don Wilson How do you do, Mr. Wilson? It's a pleasure, I'm sure And this is Dennis Day, our young tenor Mr. Day? How do you do? Dennis, don't curtsy <laughs> no, he's, 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 uh, you know, he's so polite and, oh, yes, uh, this is our <laughs> orchestra leader, Phil Harris. Uh, good evening, Mr. Harris. Hi, Orson. Still scaring people? <laughs> <laughs> Phil! Uh, don't, uh, don't pay any attention to him, Orson. He's always like that. Oh, I don't mind. He's rather amusing in his own crude way. <laughs> crude? That's very good. Uh, by the way, Jack, where's Miss Livingston? Oh, Mary's home in bed, Orson. She has a rather heavy cold. Oh, that's too bad. Has she got a nurse? I checked on that, Bob. No soap. <laughs> oh, what coarse language. I don't know where he picks those things up. Just the same. He's a very interesting study, uh, don't you think? Oh, yes, yes. Why? Why? <laughs> Now, Orson, I think we ought to get started with my rehearsal. Did you have anything in mind for the first lesson? The first lesson? Now, let's see. Benny, Benny, Benny. Oh, yes. Hmm. You see, Jack, the reason you haven't gone as far dramatically as you feel you should is because you've been selecting the wrong vehicles. I have. Definitely. For instance, if your goal is the Academy Award, as you say, you should concentrate... Uh, pardon me, Jack, there's something I must do. Miss Wentworth. Yes, Mr. Wells. Take a telegram to Mayor LaGuardia, New York City. Yes, sir. You see, Jack, you should concentrate on the heavier and more legitimate type of drama. I understand. Well, uh, what would you suggest, Orton? Dear Mayor LaGuardia, <laughs> received your telegram, and if I'm in New York on the 29th, we'll be only too happy to attend the banquet. Well. However, we'll let you know in plenty of time if I ain't coming. Ain't? <laughs> oh, why, Orson! <laughs> And you said ain't. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised. Well, Jack, the use of the word ain't is sometimes permissible. You see, in this instance, by using ain't, I saved a word in a telegram. Oh. You don't have to tell him about saving anything. <laughs> Never mind you. That's all, Miss Wentworth. Yes, sir. Now, Jack, where were we? Uh, you were about to suggest a proper vehicle for me. Oh, yes. Now, the type of play that would offer you the greatest scope for emotional histrionics would be a literary classic, something like The Hunchback of Notre Dame. The Hunchback of Notre Dame? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean Charles Lawton's part? Exactly. Well, gee, that would be swell. Mr. Christian, come here! <laughs> uh, how's that? Uh, that's from Mutiny on the Bounty. Oh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I got a little mixed up there, I guess. Uh, well, Orson, if The Hunchback is the play you feel I ought to do, let's try it out. I'm your obedient servant. <laughs> Shall we get started? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Stone, did you bring the script of The Hunchback with you? Here it is, Mr. Wells. Good. Now, Jack, here's a scene that we can start out with, which I think will give... give... Oh, pardon me, Orson. Come in. Excuse me, is Mr. Wells here? Why, yes, he is. It's your tailor, Mr. Wells. Oh, come in, Max. You might as well measure me right now. Okay, Mr. Wells. Mark this down, Sam. Right. Now, Jack, I think we can take this scene where the King of France meets the gypsy dancing girl, Esmeralda. Now, let me glance at a minute. Next, 15 and a half. 15 and a half. Chest, 42. 42. Weight, 36. 36. Legs, 29. 29. Come on, Sam. Goodbye, Mr. Wells. <laughs> Gee. Yes, I think this scene will be fine, Jack. Well, I'll do my best, Orson. Now, do you think oh, I'll... Oh, Miss Wentworth. Yes, Mr. Wells. Take a memo to the tailor. No belt in the back. <laughs> now, Orson, as I was saying, do you think I ought to give my own interpretation of the hunchback, or should I mimic Charles Lawton? In other words... Oh, darn it, excuse me. 
Hello? What? What? London? London, England? Oh, I think that's for me, Jack. Gee, London. Hello? Oh, hello, Miller. So nice of you to call. Yes, yes. Yes, I've heard splendid comment on your London production. I'd, I'd like very much to do it. Gee, all the way from London. I understand, Miller, that the Theatre Guild has sent me a script which I may have to do first, you see. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Phil, you better play something. This may take all day. Yes. My goodness, what a busy man. Now, here's the point, Miller. I'm committed to the Guild until May 30th. However, if you could arrange to hold the American rights until I'm free. <laughs> Woodpecker song played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And Phil, I'm very glad to see that you're not a hypocrite. What do you mean, hypocrite? I mean your music was the same as always. You didn't play good just because we have a distinguished visitor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Orson, shall we get started with the hunchback of Notre Dame? I'm raring to go. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. Oh, uh, Mr. Wells, I have an important message to deliver right now, and I wish you'd listen to it and give me your frank opinion. Oh, I'd be glad to, Miss Wilson. Don, Orson is here to help me. Well, now, Jack, this will only take a second. Ladies and gentlemen, next time you're in the mood for attempting an appetizing dessert, go to your neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of Jell-O. You will find it's not only economical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors. So be sure to insist on genuine Jell-O and look for the big red letters on the box. Wow. How was that, Mr. Wells? Very good, very good. But I wish there was some place you could bring elephants in there. <laughs> Elephants, what an imagination. Well, let's get to me now, eh, Orson? All right, Jack, I see you're ready to play the hunchback. What did you do, stuff a pillow up your back? No, no, that's this suit. I must have it altered. <laughs> Say, Orson, I was just thinking, of course, I don't want to complain or anything, but as I remember in the picture, uh, Quasimodo, the hunchback, had very little to say. In fact, all he did was grunt and groan. Not very dramatic, is it? Well, now that's where you're wrong, Jack. A groan or a grunt, if properly delivered can convey as much emotion as a whole page of dialogue. Well, perhaps you're right, although I never thought of that. Huh? Now tell me, Jack, can you groan? Groan? <laughs> you ought to hear him on payday. <laughs> Phil, you're the only one I resent paying. Well, now that you've explained it, Orson, I think I can handle it all right. Very good, then let's get started. Now, this particular scene calls for the King of France. I'll play that. Frollo, the King's High Justice. I'll play that, too. Hmm. Quasimodo, the Hunchback. That must be me. Yes. And Esmeralda, the Gypsy Girl, or Miss Wentworth. Would you care to help us out, please? Delighted, Mr. Wells. Now, Orson, I noticed in the script here that Quasimodo rings the bells in the Tower of Notre Dame. Do you want me to ring them? No, I'll handle the bell. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Oh, and oh. incidentally, uh, J Jack, yeah. at the uh, finish of this particular scene, you have a very dramatic speech where you tell Esmeralda not to be afraid of you. It's really the high spot of the play. Oh, well, I'll sure try and get it right, Orson. All right, then, let's proceed. We open first with Esmeralda and Frollo. Now, quiet, everybody. Quiet, everybody. Mr. Wells is about to rehearse. You have the first line, Miss Wentworth. Yes, sir. <coughs> Let me go. Don't touch me. You have the hands of a devil. Great. For such talk, I could have you burned at the stake. I am the law. Yes, the law that drives my people out of France. You deserve it. You are thieves and swindlers. You are lazy and you live by magic tricks and sorcery. But you don't know the gypsies. I don't want to know them. I want to wipe them out with fire and sword. Every one of them. <laughs> uh, how, how was that, Orson? 
just grown once, Jack. Oh, oh, I've grown twice. Now, at this point, King Louis XI of France enters the scene. Esmeralda speaks. Oh, thank heaven. The king approaches. Maybe he will listen to me. You will be heard. I will help you, my child. Your Majesty. But you must give me a good reason. They say you are a lot of thieves. Oh, no, Your Majesty. Whenever we steal, it is because we are hungry. Help us, Sire. Please help us. I will help you. You and your people will suffer no longer. <laughs> Go, go back to your, go back to your people, my child, and tell them that their king will see that they have food and shelter, and that in the future they shall be unmolested. For this, I needed a teacher. <laughs> now look, Orson, I don't know what's wrong, but I don't feel those groans. Maybe I ain't breathing right. Jack, don't say ain't. It's bad English. Well, for heaven's sake, you said it. That was in a telegram. Oh, well, Miss Wentworth, take a wire to Mr. Wells. <laughs> Dear Orson, I ain't breathing right. <laughs> and another thing, Orson, when do I get to that long speech of mine? It's right here at the top of the next page. Esmeralda speaks again. Continue, Miss Wentworth. Oh, thank you, Your Majesty. My people will always be grateful. Rest easy, my child, and now, goodbye. Goodbye, sire. Oh, wait, Your Majesty. Who is this ugly, misshapen creature that is staring at me? I'm frightened. That's your cue, Jack. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is I, Quasimodo. Do not be terrified of me. I am not a man and not a beast. Yes, I am human, too. I have a heart and a warm soul. But people... Hey, wait a minute, Orson. You're drowning out my voice. Well, the script calls for bells. I don't care. You don't have to ring them that loud, do you? I'm sorry. Try your speech again. Oh, Mr. Stone, will you ring the bells this God. time? I want to watch Mr. Benny. Yes, sir. Uh, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> it is I, Quasimodo. Do not be terrified of me. I am not a man and not a beast. The more look down Hello? upon him. Yes, he's here. It's for Yet you, Mr. Wells. New York, New York calling. Thank you. I have a heart Hello? that warns to others. Oh, Hello, Harrington. Listen, Harrington, I've been trying to reach you all day. I will be the one because day. my soul is a prison. When do you think I'll get the proof in an ugly book? body? Now, it will be all the more painful. You promised that two weeks ago. And all that is good. Harrington, this is the last That is why I look at you. You are very beautiful. How about you come with me this time? My husband, this is Oh, for crying out loud. How can I act with all this going on? For heaven's sake. Oh, Mr. Wells, your suit is ready for a fitting. Thank you, Max. I'll try it on here. Oh, the heck with it. Play, Phil. <laughs> what I go through for a career. Folks, if you're looking for a swell dessert to serve for Easter dinner next Sunday, look no farther. Because here it is, the whole answer in a pastry shell, Jell-O Easter tarts. Each one heaped to the brim with clear golden orange jello and the several sections of tender juicy oranges. Yes, believe me, it's a glorious treat and just as simple as it is satisfying. To make it, all you do is dissolve one package of orange jello in one pint of hot water. Chill until slightly thickened. Divide three medium oranges into sections, drain them, and arrange in eight baked tart shells. Fill the shells with jello, chill, and then, if desired, garnish with whipped cream before serving. The result, ladies and gentlemen, is a truly marvelous dessert. So plan now to highlight next Sunday's dinner with one of the most delicious and intriguing treats you ever tasted, jello Easter tarts, a grand combination of plump, juicy oranges and rich, brilliant orange jello.
the last number of the 24th program in the current Jello series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Say, Orson, I'm sorry I blew up the way I did, but I would like to become a dramatic actor. Well, Jack, those things take time, but I'll tell you what. Come over to my show next Sunday. We're going to do June Mo Moon, and there's a swell part in it for you. Well, gee, I'll be glad to. Will I have to groan much? In uh, no. <laughs> No, Jack, there isn't a single groan in the entire play. Oh, gosh, and just when I had it down pat. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> J-E-L-L-O And here's more fun and enjoyment for you. Tune in every Tuesday night for another swell half hour of Jell-O entertainment, the famous Aldrich family. See your local paper or our movie and radio guide for time and station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. From 84 years ago, March 17, 1940, the Jack Benny Show here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Coming up next, we'll head uh, to uh, 75 years ago, March 17, 1949, for an episode of Abbott and Costello and yet... Another Sam Shovel mystery. Keep your guard up. That's the key slogan of the 1950 National Guard Recruiting Drive, and it's a slogan as timely as today's headlines. More than ever before, America stands prepared, and the National Guard must recruit approximately 220,000 men as soon as possible. By joining the National Guard, young men will have the advantage of choosing their own unit and preparing themselves for promotion by being in a job for which they are best qualified. Investigate the National Guard now. Help America to keep up its guard. Thank you for joining us for the Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox podcast now. March 17th, 1949, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, and yet another Sam Shovel story. Hey, Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. <laughs> yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure with chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! Oh, there you be, Abbott, me by. Top of the morning to your faith and be gory, Makushla, Glockamora, and the House of Murphy to you. Wait a minute, what is all this? You know, this is St. Patrick's Day and I'm celebrating. Well, wait a minute, what are you wearing that is green? Well, that's the old solid gold watch you gave me for Christmas. <laughs> now that you mention that watch, Castell, I bought that in Ireland. I know it, Abbott. Listen to the watch. No, half past Barry Fitzgerald. <laughs> Cut this out, Costello. Where have you been all afternoon? Well, Abbott, see, I went to a picture show over in Hollywood Boulevard. I saw a wonderful picture called When the Howling Coyotes Meet the Riders of the Purple Sage on a Lone Prairie Under a Texas Moon. What's the picture about? Two jockeys at Santa Anita. <laughs> I met a beautiful blonde in the theater, and I said to her, Miss, you are the epitome of womanhood and the graceful flowing lines of your gorgeous figure are the flawless perfection of... Femininity! <laughs> Femininity! I heard it, I heard it! I like the word! Femininity! All right, all right. <laughs> Costello, where did you learn so much about women? I read that small print on a corset ad. Corset? <laughs> I say, did you take this girl home? Yes, when I was kissing her in the hall, I accidentally stuck my thumb in an electric light socket in the wall. And what happened? That girl is now a stoplight on the corner of Sunset and La Brea. <laughs> How a girl could ever go out with you? Uh, with you, a uh, stupid, illiterate, clumsy... Just a minute, Abbott, I'm not stupid. You're not stupid. Oh, no. You can't even recite the alphabet. Yeah, well, listen to this. A, B, C, one. 
DEF2, GHI3, JKL4. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are you saying the alphabet that way? Because I learned it off a telephone dial. <laughs> Costello, were you born an imbecile? No. What I am today, I owe to my mother. Get him out of here. Get any further involved in nonsense. Here's a thought that makes good sense. What's on your mind? What's on my mind? Yes. My mother wants to thank you for that St. Patrick's Day present you sent her. She says it's the cutest little washing machine she ever had. Washing machine? Mm. Yeah, dummy, that's a mix master. You know, I thought it was funny. Every time she put in a tablecloth, she got back 12 napkins. <laughs> what did you give your mother for St. Patrick's Day, Lou? Well, I gave her that garbage disposal that I want on Stop the Music. You want, you want a garbage disposal on Stop the Music? Yeah, they're wonderful people on the show, Abbott. They not only gave me the garbage disposal, they also gave me a five-year supply of garbage. <laughs> Costello, you, you've got to stop hanging around these quiz shows. You're just wasting your time. No, I am not. Yes, no? you are. I was on a new quiz show last week, and it's a California Frost Warning Show. Uh, the fro Frost Warning Show has a quiz show? What's the name of it? Stop the Weather. <laughs> You should have seen the prizes they had. Fifty tons of star-kissed tuna. A smudge pot for every female member of your family. A thousand sets of general squeegee tires. A pool table for every room in your house. A carload of strong, hot dog food. A package of lifesavers. All the iodine your family can drink for one year. <laughs> your entire house is decorated with fly paper. Five hundred pounds of coffee from Brazil and a beautiful senorita to have breakfast with you for the rest of your life and serve you the Brazilian coffee. <laughs> Who won all this? I did, but I had to turn it down. Why? You know I don't drink coffee. I... <laughs> <laughs> Why, does coffee keep you awake, Lou? No, but it helps. <laughs> around talking like an idiot. Because idiots go around talking like me. <laughs> well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Remember, I'm working with you. Do you want these people to go out of here thinking that I'm a jerk? Why not? That's the way they came in. <laughs> That's a fine way to talk to me. That's gratitude. After all the things I did for you. What things? Remember the time you got locked in the cellar and couldn't get out? Yes. Who fed and, who fed and took care of your dog for three weeks? You did. Who pushed food through a little window to you all the time you were locked in there? You did. And last March, when you disappeared, nobody heard from you. Nobody knew where you were, and nobody had the slightest idea where to locate you. Who finally found you? The man from the income tax. <laughs> I don't blame them for looking for you. I, I hope you send in your tax return this year. I certainly did, Abbott. Every American could send in his income tax to Washington. They should do that. It's the patriotic thing to do. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. And besides, they watch you too close. <laughs> I hope you filled out your estimated uh, return for next year. What's that? 
Well, that's the part of the income tax uh, blank where it says uh, estimated income for 1949. They want you to guess how much you're going to make next year. Oh, sure, I filled that out and I sent it in, but I didn't sign my name to it. Well, you idiot, if you didn't sign it, how will they know who it's from? Abbott, if they want me to guess how much I'm going to make next year, then let them guess who sent it in. (laughs) And if they don't stop raising the income taxes, it's going to break up the whole country. What do you mean? Well, at the last session of Congress, they took a vote, and I'm proud to say that California was voted the state most likely to secede. (laughs) Oh, forget about the income tax. You know, today is St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day was caused by income tax. What do you mean? Everyone pays their income tax on the 15th of March, don't they? Right. Then two days later, on the 17th of March, people march in parades all over the country. Well, what have people marching on St. Patrick's Day got to do with uh, the income tax? Don't you get it? They have to march. We ain't got enough money left to ride. <laughs> Uncle Louie, Uncle Louie. Hey, Uncle Louie. <laughs> it's Abbott's nephew, folks. Sincerely, it is. What are you so excited about, Norman? Well, I just rushed over here, Uncle Louie, to tell you that they finally caught those two guys. What two guys? The two guys that voted to raise President Truman's salary. <laughs> I gotta set a trap for that. <laughs> There's a smart kid, Abbott. They learned he, <laughs> he learned to skate before he could walk. Oh, that's silly. How could Norman learn to skate before he could walk? He had to. When he was born, he was so ugly that his folks kept him locked in the icebox. <laughs> you want to be careful what you say about Norman. Remember, he's a pretty tough kid. And he comes from a tough neighborhood. He comes from a tough neighborhood? Yeah. Abbott, the neighborhood I come from in Patterson, New Jersey, was so tough that when I was going to school, if we saw a kid on my block with teeth, we were sure one thing. Uh, what was that? He was either a stranger in the neighborhood or he was wearing upper and lower plates. <laughs> oh, you aren't so tough, Costello. Why, for two cents, I'd punch you in the nose. I beg your pardon? For two cents, I'd punch you in the nose, myself. Oh, yeah? Yes. Go ahead and see what happens. Okay. Well? See what happened? It's bleeding. <laughs> I'm glad I punched you in the nose. You had it coming to you. When I was at your house last night, your brother Pat accused me of stealing a bottle of champagne. You're the most honest man I know. Well, thank you, Costello. Makes my blood boil to hear people talk that way about you. I'll find anybody that even insinuates that you're dishonest. Gosh, Lou, I'm sorry I punched you in the nose. You're a real pal. Uh, let's have a drink on our friendship, huh? Okay. Well, uh, uh, what will you have? How about opening that bottle of champagne that you stole off my brother? <laughs> Uh, Costello, I, I, I haven't got the champagne. Oh, drank it all up, eh? <laughs> I didn't take the champagne. All your brother Pat has got uh, is circumstantial evidence, Lou. It's no use, Abbott. It's written all over your face. What's written all over my face? I don't know. I can't read. I... <laughs> I'm discussing with you. I'm going to leave you and I'll leave California. I can't stand this weather anyway. Well, Abbott, there's nothing wrong with the weather in California. The California weather is very healthy. It's the people that get sick. (laughs) Mr. Costello, Mr. Costello, I have a message here for you from your Aunt May. What is it, my good man? Your Aunt May said to tell you that your Uncle Mike swallowed a half dollar and it's stuck in his throat and he's choking to death. And she wants you to come over Sunday and help get it out. Well, if he's choking to death, Anna, why is she going to wait till Sunday to take it out? Well, she figures she won't need the money till then. (laughs) If Gabriel Heater is listening in... There's all jokes tonight. That was another one of Abbott's relatives, folks. Hey, Abbott, why don't you go right through with the deal and get your wife on the show? You you mean you'd like to have my wife on the show? I'd welcome her with relish. Why with relish? Because she's got a shape like a hot dog. (laughs) She has not. My wife has a gorgeous figure. Not another one like it. When they made her, they threw them all away. Yes, some guy found it, and he's been making ash cans ever since. (laughs) Costello, I'll have you know that my wife has been offered a job at Earl Carroll. What's the matter with the scrub woman they got now? I... <laughs> scrub woman? They want her to appear in the finale of the show wearing a bathing suit. And when my wife wears a bathing suit, she attracts plenty of attention. I'll say she does. She was floating on her back in the water at Santa Monica last Sunday and three Catalina flying boats landed on her chest. <laughs> Boys. Well, hello. Oh, hello, Viola Vine. Viola Vine, Lou. 
Gee, Viola, I'm glad you came over tonight. How's about you and I stepping out after the show? You can come with me to the dog show. You're going to the dog show? Yes, and I expect to win a blue ribbon with my setter. Costello, from where I'm standing, you can't miss. <laughs> Did it again. All right, Costello, calm down. She's only fooling. Oh, Lou, don't be so touchy. Well, I you can't help it. Uh-huh. You know, oh, oh, come on, you, you know I'm really crazy about you. Oh, if you... <laughs> yes, I am. And to prove it, I'm going to take you to the opera next week. Now, Monday night, they're playing Hansel and Gretel. Tuesday night, they're having Samson and Delilah. Wednesday night, they're having Tristan and Isolde. What night would you like to go? The night they're having spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> Spaghetti and meatballs. That's the trouble with you. You know nothing about opera, nothing about culture. <laughs> Mr. Abbott is right. You need more culture. You should become literary, But gee, I, I always try. <laughs> Look, read good books. Oh, oh. Yeah, but... <laughs> books are your best friend. Don't lose your place, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you're lonely, pick up a book. When you feel like stepping out at night, don't do it. Pick up a book. When you feel like going out with a girl... Pick up a book. <sighs> well, so long. I've got to go now. I've got a date with Gregory Peck. Uh, Viola Vaughn, after all those things you got through telling me about how wonderful books are, you're going out with a man? Sure, I'm lucky. I never learned to read. <laughs> <laughs> so long, Pastor. That's only half the fun, folks. Just as many laughs yet to come. But first, listen to this. Now the spotlight turns to Howl Winters, our singing star. Here he is with Matty Malnick and his orchestra. Now Clancy was a peaceful man, if you know what I mean. The cops picked up the pieces after Clancy left the scene. He never looked for trouble, that's a fact you can assume. But nevertheless, when trouble would press, Clancy lowered the boom. Oh, that Clancy, oh, that Clancy. Whenever they got his Irish up, Clancy lowered the boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. O'Leary was a fighting man, they all knew he was tough. He strutted round the neighborhood, a shooting off his guff. He picked a fight with Clancy, then and there he sealed his doom. Before you could shout, oh, dearly, look out! Clancy lowered the boom. Oh, that Clancy! Oh, that Clancy! Whenever they got his Irish up, Clancy lowered the boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Mulrooney walked into the bar and ordered up a round. He left his drink to telephone, and Clancy drank it down. Mulrooney said, who drunk me drink? I'll lay him in his tomb. Before you could pat the top of your hat, Clancy lowered the boom. Oh, that Clancy. Oh, that Clancy. Whenever they got his Irish up, Clancy lowered the boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. boom. Oh, Houlihan delivered ice to Mrs. Clancy's flat. He'd always linger for a while to talk of this and that. One day he kissed her just as Clancy walked into the room. Before you could say the time of the day, Clancy lowered the boom. Oh, that Clancy! Oh, that Clancy! 
Whenever they got his Irish up, Clancy lowered the boom, 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 boom. Clancy lowered the boom. Quiet. You know the hell with this guy, nice voice, that kid? I know all about it. He's going places. I know it. In fact, you just left the building now. <laughs> all right, Costello, come on out here. Look. Who were you talking to on the phone? My Uncle Mike. Boy, is he in trouble. My Aunt May just threw him out of the house. She'd done a terrible thing. What did he do? Well, you know them two towers they got marked his and hers? Yes. Well, he used hers. I... <laughs> Costello, I'm ashamed of you. How can you come out here in front of intelligent people and make such a statement? You want everybody to think you're a moron? Well, if I didn't, I wouldn't have a tattooed on my arm, would I? Well, never mind that. Our secretary, Viola Vaughn, has been complaining about you, too. Well, I don't believe it. Viola and I are good neighbors. She lives right next door to me, and we're very friendly. Costello, Viola would make a nice wife for you. Her folks are very rich, and you should do all you can to win her. Not me, Abbott. Her family's too snooty. Yesterday, her mother was driving along in a 1949 Hudson, and... Her 1949 Hudson? Why, just last week, she bought a 1948 Hudson. I know, but she had to get rid of it. The ashtrays were full. <laughs> anyway, I don't need to marry no rich girl. I'm making plenty of money in my detective business. Hello, what is your Sam Shovel detective mystery about that? Well, it's a very intriguing case, Abbott. I call it the case of the cannibal who cooked the long-haired musician, or it was his first square meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds terrible, but let's do it. Yes, I'm Sam Shovel. Sam Shovel, private detective. He needs help tonight. I just left the locker room of the gym of the YAMCA. I'm walking to my little office. I think I'm being followed. I hear footsteps behind me. I quicken my pace. Whoever is following me has quickened his pace. I decide to dart into the alley. <laughs> a sinister-looking man ducked in the alley with me. I decide to run. Stop, Sam Shovel, stop. Listen, you, what's the idea of following me? Who's following you? When you left the locker room, you buttoned my suspenders to the back of your pants. <laughs> Anything is liable to happen to you in this business. I arrive at my office. The floor is all covered with fallen leaves. There are twigs all over the floor. This is my branch office. <laughs> I remember when I started this business in 1928. I didn't have a penny to my name. My clothes were shabby. My shoes were full of holes. That was in 1928. Then a horrible thing happened. In 1929, the Depression hit me and I lost everything. <laughs> That's long enough. I pick up the phone. Hello? Is Boo there? Boo-hoo. Huh? Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. Oh, don't cry. Things ain't so bad. <laughs> it's times like this that I wish my pal Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad was here. There's a real cop. When he goes after a crook, he leaves no stone unturned. He never caught anybody, but he's turned over every stone in Los Angeles. <laughs> Abbott is quite a talker. Every time he opens his mouth, he puts his foot in it. One day, while he was sitting with his foot in his mouth, the chief hit him over the head. <laughs> Abbott sat right down and wrote a big song hit. All I want for Christmas is my two front toes. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott is used to getting hit on the head. He's got so many stitches in his head that he has to comb his hair with knitting needles. Hello, Sam Shovel. It's my pal, Lieutenant Abbott. Sam, you look mighty tired. I am, Lieutenant. <laughs> Every day I have all the weight of this office in my lap. You mean you have all the weight of this office on your shoulders? No, my secretary won't sit on my shoulders. <laughs> Besides, I ain't been feeling so good. I got punk toothbrush. No, you mean you got pink toothbrush. No, I mean punk toothbrush. The bristles are all falling out. <laughs> Talk said, Sam. I've been looking for you. Where were you all day? Driving around Beverly Hills. Oh, I love to drive around Beverly Hills. So do I. You hit a better class of pedestrians up there. <laughs> you were there on a case, I presume? Yes, a real clever crook. 
He's the only guy I ever saw who would work both ends against the middle and get away with it. What does he do? Plays the accordion. <laughs> Enough of this chit-chat, Sam. You're in plenty of trouble. Uh, you were responsible for sending a machine gun Magoon to prison and his mall. Dangerous Dorothy has sworn to get you. Yes, Dangerous Dorothy, the most beautiful gun mall in the racket. Lieutenant, you say that Dorothy was sworn to get me? Yes. Well, I got news for you. She can have me. <laughs> ah, so there you are. Don't move, coppers. These guns are loaded. Damn, it's her. Dangerous Dorothy. Lieutenant Abbott, I'm going to kill you. Please don't kill me, Dorothy. I'm too young to die. I, I beg you. I beg of you on bonded knees. Not bonded knees. You're wrong. That's bended knees. He's right. With all the stuff he guzzles, his knees are bonded. <laughs> please, Dorothy, don't shoot me. Please, please. Lieutenant Abbott, I'm ashamed of you. Roveling on your knees like a sniveling coward. Be like me. I'll tell her a thing or... Sam Shovel, I'm gonna kill you, too. <clears throat> now, what were you gonna say? Abbott... You're taking up the whole floor. Move over. Give me more room to kneel down. Dorothy, please, Ferris. We'll do anything to make to make amends. Anything you say. Yes, Dorothy. You shouldn't be mad at me. I think you're beautiful. Come on, let you and me kiss and make up. What do you mean kiss and make up? We just met. Well, let's kiss and make up for all the time we lost. <laughs> well, I don't know. My boyfriend, Machine Gun Magoon's in prison. And I am kind of lonesome. Viola. Why not let Sam cheer you up? He's quite a lover, you know. How good would you say you are, Sam? You know, in my mob, we rate the guys according to the number of girls that are crazy about him. If a guy's got six girls crazy about him, he's called a cannon. Five girls, he's a shotgun. Two girls, he's a revolver. Well, Sam, how do you stack up? Shake hands with a water pistol. <laughs> Sam, you're cute. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you could be the guy to take Magoon's place. I'm going to give you a chance. Come here. What are you going to do? I'm going to kiss you a couple of times. <laughs> How's uh, that? That's what I call a hydromatic kiss. A hydromatic kiss? Yes, she went from first to second without shifting. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I think you got her. Huh? I think you got her, Sam. Yeah, Play up to her and... And she may not kill us. Dorothy, if I can make you forget Magoon, will you spare our lives? Sam, I'll accept your proposition. If you can give me a kiss that'll make me forget Magoon, I won't shoot you. Uh, uh, and you won't shoot me either. It's a deal. Sam. Sam, I'm the... That's me. Excuse me. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Sam, I'm depending on you. Put everything you got into this kiss. It means our lives. Don't worry, Lieutenant. They don't call me love lips, Sam, for nothing. Come here, Dorothy. <laughs> well, Dorothy, what do you think? Ladies and gentlemen... Wait a minute, just a minute. Two shots, please. That's right. He's <laughs> just going to kill me off alone. He goes with me. <laughs> now, Viola <laughs> It says here, two loud shots <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear a detective show next week Tune in to the fat man, Ellery <laughs> Queen, or this is your FBI. Oh, you get out of here, will you? <laughs> now, before Abbott and Costello have their final fling, we bring you one more thought on this subject.
Al Costello. That was quite an interesting case you did tonight. Uh, Would you like to tell the folks what your Sam Shovel case was for uh, case for next week is about? <laughs> he really I got you, didn't he? Right <laughs> Would you like to tell the folks uh, what your Sam Shovel case for next week is about? Yeah, yes, I would. That's fine. Folks, next week I will do a murder story. I call it the case of the young bride who set fire to her 60-year-old husband's beard, or there's no fuel like an old fuel. <laughs> That's it, folks, and our writers are working on it now. Our writing staff is headed by Eddie Foreman with Paul Conlon, Pat Costello, Martin Ragaway, and Len Stern. Our sound men, I don't know. <laughs> Our producer is Charles Bender. Be sure to be with us next Thursday. Good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Patterson. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station. Seventy-five years ago, March 17, 1945, Abbott and Costello. Tomorrow, uh, we will have uh, the Casey Crime Photographer, Dangerous Assignment, an I Was a Communist with the FBI episode, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and The Weird Circle. That's all coming up on our Monday show. Uh, right now, an episode of The Halls of Ivy, starring Ronald and Benita Coleman. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next seven years of bigger and bigger enrollments, America's grade schools will need nearly a quarter of a million extra teachers besides those to fill normal vacancies. This great need, plus the growing public interest in education and improvements in schools, make elementary school teaching a more rewarding career than ever, a career that high school and college students should certainly consider. Education holds America's future, perhaps your future. Thank you, Mr. Fenneman. Uh, the uh, Colemans were, be- were very well known as dramatic actors. Uh, it was, however, their performance on the Jack Benny program that got them this. Ronald and Benita Coleman, because on the Jack Benny program, they showed quite the comedic flair uh, as Jack Benny's next-door neighbor. So we have here an episode of The Halls of Ivy as it was broadcast 74 years ago today, March 17th. 1950, yes, even in Ivy, there is dirty politics. Ladies and gentlemen, the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. If you like good beer, you'll find it pays to be curious and learn about Schlitz for yourself. And now, the Halls of Ivy. The Halls of Ivy. That surround us here today And we will not forget Though we be far, far away Welcome again to Ivy Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA Today is the windiest day of the windiest month of the year here at Ivy It's also the day chosen by the members of Ivy's Board of Governors for their quarterly meeting. I'll let those who will make the most of this coincidence. Ivy's president, Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, is out walking this afternoon with his wife, the former Victoria Cromwell, of the English musical comedy stage. 
As they round the corner of the library, Mrs. Hall says... There's Mr. Wellman. Where? Where? Over there, heading this way. Oh, yes. That's really a remarkable strut he has. It is, isn't it? Yeah, look at him, look. He's marching four abreast all by himself. <laughs> I sometimes wonder, Victoria, if we're not a bit too hostile toward Mr. Wellman. You know, there's much to be said in his favor. He began life as a poor boy and pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. He's now a power in the canned soup business and chairman of our board of governors. You've got to hand it to him. I know. If you don't, he just reaches out and grabs it anyway. <laughs> he seems to be smiling. A beastly little smile. Like the canary who swallowed the cat. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just thought of something to make the board bedevil you. Oh, now, now, Vicky, we mustn't judge him too harshly. You haven't had a change of heart about him, have you? In Victoria, Mr. Wellman has often been arrogant and discourteous to me. He has occasionally been mean and spiteful. Nevertheless, there is something about the man that renders him, in my eyes at least, uh, obnoxious. <laughs> well, thank heaven. I thought for a moment you were ill. <laughs> oh, but I've been wondering if perhaps it wouldn't be better for the school if I tried to establish a friendlier relationship with him. What would your reaction be if I invited him to dinner this evening? My usual reaction. My shoulders would sag with delight. Oh, please, please don't invite him, Toddy. I never know what to talk to him about. I've always considered you a tower of strength, conversationally. When Mr. Wellman is present, I'm a tower of jello. Let's, um, let's not rush into it. All right, my dear. Uh, another time, perhaps. Yes, later in the spring, when the passenger pigeons return. Uh, darling, the passenger pigeon is extinct. How nice. <laughs> At any rate, I, I see no reason why I shouldn't offer him an olive branch, do you? No, except he's liable to bash you about the head with it. No, I think I can be relied upon to make him accept it in the spirit in which it's offered. If I say so myself, I'm a pretty good diplomat. You know, the even temper, the retort courteous, the subtle flattery subtly conveyed. I, I have them all at my command when I set my mind to it. Um, Hall the charm boy, they used to call me. <laughs> Now, you just watch me melt away his hostility. Ah, mm. uh, good afternoon, Mr. Wellman. I couldn't, oh, uh, but... it's you, Hall. Mrs. Hall? Uh, yes, as, as I watched you coming toward us, I, I couldn't help thinking that much of your success must be due to the, the resoluteness so apparent in your walk with which you approach any task, even an ordinary meeting of the board. This isn't going to be an ordinary meeting, if I can help it. Far from it. Have you seen today's newspaper? Uh, no, I haven't. Here, read that. Read that. Mm. Oh, I... Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> You're going to liven it up a bit, are you? <laughs> Play a few practical jokes, eh? Oh, clever, very clever. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? What are you reading? <laughs> Listen, Vicky. Now on sale, largest collection of itch powder and dribble glasses in town. A million laughs. <laughs> no, not the advertisement. The column next to it. Uh, oh. <laughs> What? What is it? Town council passes resolution condemning vice on Ivy Campus. How how dare they perpetrate such an outrageous insult? The point, Dr. Hall, is how you dare permit such a condition to flourish here at the school. Mr. Wellman, surely you know as well as I there is no basis in fact for this, this, this contemptible lie. I know only that for years, against your opposition, I have tried to do away with the very thing at which the town council now points an accusing finger. Willow Walk. Oh. Is that what the town council means by vice? Our local lover's lane? Precisely. And they're quite right. Though it shames me to admit it. We all know what goes on in Willow Walk on spring evenings. Do we? What? <laughs> Never having been there myself, Mrs. Hall, I am not prepared with a bill of particulars. But I am equipped with an imagination. Then I suggest that if the town council must point an accusing finger at vice, let it be pointed at your imagination. Huh. That's the only place on the campus that exists. <laughs> well, I shall, of course, discuss your interesting comment uh, about my imagination with the rest of the board this afternoon. And I request permission to appear in person and discuss it myself. Granted. I shall place the matter of the town council's resolution at the bottom of the agenda. We'll arrive at it around 4.30. I'll be there. Good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Hall. Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> um... Well, where, where were we? 
Um, what, what were we talking about before this happened? Oh, diplomacy. Oh. The even temper, the retort courteous. Yes, I, I wasn't very diplomatic, was I? Oh, I don't know. As diplomacy goes these days. No. No, no I behaved badly. You didn't behave at all, I'm proud to say. The students were being vilely insulted, and so naturally you exploded. Yes, I really did, didn't I? You certainly did, I, I say. <laughs> Will you ever forget the expression on his face when you told him where you thought the town council ought to point? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> the memory of it will make me the jolliest ex-college president on the breadline. <laughs> oh, dear. I'll bet Wellman will work the board into a frenzy over this. Yes, unless I apologize. No, under the circumstances, I think bread is far more palatable than humble pie. What the devil provoked the town council to issue such a blast? So completely without foundation. I know that enmity between the town and the gown is proverbial in academic history, but... Hello, Victoria. Uh, oh, hello, Pauline. Oh, well, Good afternoon, Dr. Hall. Good afternoon. Would you like a lift? My car's right over there. No, thank you, Professor Larson. We're out for a stroll. Oh, you're dressed to the nines, Pauline. I never saw you look lovelier. Are you going on a date? Oh, no. I'm on my way to a council meeting at Town Hall. Do you think I look attractive enough to hold the councilman's attention for five minutes? That's all the time they've allotted me to speak against a bill they're considering. Mm. I think they'd be only too happy to spend five minutes just looking at you. Why, thank you, dear. <laughs> um, is this to be a little field expedition on behalf of your political science department, Professor? Oh, no. No, the Town Civic Reform League has asked me to help stop the passage of a bill which extends, or practically without reservation, the powers of the town council. Mm. The boys in the back room are trying to push it through so as to help them rig elections more easily. Well, I'm sure you'll prove most effective. I doubt it. You see, the Reform League's only a few years old, while the local machine was already raiding the pork barrel at a time when Tammany Hall was just a gleam in Aaron Burr's eye. <laughs> no, I'm afraid this bill will go through with a whoop and a holler. Well, what in blazes is happening downtown? Yesterday, a baseless accusation of vice on the campus... Today, a crooked bill? Well, the machine has recently been taken over by P.T. Granger, the honest brakeman. And he... The honest brakeman? Uh-huh. That's what the newspaper boys call him. Due to the fact that he once spent eight years working in the freight yards and never stole a locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> he's a new broom and he sweeps dirty. And he's very much interested in you. In me? Mm -hmm. How do you know? He's been sitting in that convertible over there for the past few minutes, just staring at you. Mm, oh. He's a strange-looking bird, I must say. I've never seen such brilliant plumage. Are you familiar with the species, William? Oh, only through books, I'm sorry to admit. They're called uh, scalawags, ticky-fingered scalawags, or politicus corruptus. Oh. <laughs> they feed largely on public apathy, foul other birds' nests, and, although the plumage varies, may be easily identified by their bills, which are crooked. And their song which sounds something like, uh, what's in it for me, what's in it for me? Oh, no. <laughs> Do let's have a closer look. Oh, I intend to immediately. Uh, Professor Larson, yes. if you should happen to think of some way of snaring this bird, I hope you'll inform me. I have a collector's itch to see him stuffed and mounted in the Ivy Museum of Natural History. Uh, Come on, Vicky, let's tackle Granger. <laughs> Goodbye, Paulie, and good luck. Thank you, dear. Bye. Shall you um, have another go at diplomacy? Uh, at uh, this time, I shall maintain an even temper. Coolness and calculation are the best weapons in situations like this, if I've read my Machiavelli correctly. Hmm. Uh, cool and calculating, therefore, I shall be. Uh, Mr. Granger? Quite right. <laughs> Mr. Quite right. Mr. P.T. Granger? Quite right. <laughs> well, what the devil do you mean by accusing us of tolerating vice at the school? Darling, Machiavelli, Machiavelli. How dare you vilify us? How dare you besmirch us? Go ahead, Doc. Let it out. Only natural considering. <laughs> quite right. Quite right. I demand an explanation. Sure you don't. Knew you would. Quite right. I suggest some other phrase entirely correct or indubitably true. <laughs> you needle easy, Mrs. Hall. Uh, Doc, I made the council pass that resolution just to let you know I was around. Nothing personal in it, just politics. Leading up to a little favor I want you to do for me. You actually have the colossal gall to expect a favor of me? <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> You'll do it, too. I am not a betting man, Granger, but in this instance, I am prepared to give odds you're wrong. Uh, save your money, Doc. I got you taped from here to breakfast, and I say you'll do it. <laughs> you'll do it, or you'll learn that what the council did to the school yesterday is nothing compared to what I'm ready to make it to. <laughs> the way I got you pegged, you'll do almost anything to... 
saved the school's fair name. <laughs> Isn't that the way you'd say it? Just what is it you want, Granger? Ready to play ball, eh? <laughs> Quite right, quite right. <laughs> Nothing else you can do. Doc, I'm getting ready to move into politics on a statewide basis. I don't know who yet, but I'm entering a candidate in the next election for governor. Whoever it turns out to be, I see him as a man just lousy with respectability. <laughs> go on, go on. Well, guess whose name I want right up at the top of the list of prominent people heartily endorsing my man. Granger, I am at a slight disadvantage in dealing with this situation, even after studying Plato's Republic, Moore's Utopia, and Aristotle's Politica. What state do they operate in? <laughs> uh, the state of enlightenment. I doubt if you've ever crossed the border. <laughs> However, <laughs> cut it short, Doc. I... It's all settled anyway. <laughs> I got more important things to do. I got to listen to the race results in a couple of minutes. However, I have faced greater terrors than any you have so far conjured up. Differential calculus, astrophysics, and French irregular verbs, to name a few. A moment ago, you asked me to guess something. Now I'll ask you. Guess where I'll see you first before I grant you that favor. <laughs> Show and fight, eh? Quite right, quite right. Take a walk around the block, Doc, and think it over. I'll be here another 20 minutes. Enjoy those 20 minutes, Granger, because when I return, I am going to run you right out of town, so help me. What? Quite right, quite right. <laughs> I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Before we return to the halls of Ivy, let's listen to the story of a man who went to Florida and, like the Spaniards before him, made an important discovery. From where I sat, stretched out, relaxed in the terrace of my hotel, Florida was a production in Technicolor. The greens and blues of the ocean, the sky, and the palm trees were intense. And so, too, was my satisfaction. It was one of those settings where you might say all that was needed to complete the picture of utter contentment was a bottle of Schlitz beer. But that came later. At the moment, all I knew of Schlitz was its fame. So I dozed in my chair and only dimly conscious of the hotel waiters passing back and forth serving others on the terrace. Slowly, my attention was drawn to the trays they carried, or rather, what they carried on them. It seemed that Schlitz beer was getting quite a play from the paying customers. And as the number of Schlitz orders began to add up, I became more and more impressed. Then I remembered having read that Schlitz was the most popular beer in the world. My contentment gradually gave way to curiosity, until I found myself wide awake and wondering why Schlitz was so much in demand. Of course, there was only one way to find out. I ordered a bottle of Schlitz. And one deep swallow told me what I wanted to know. Let me put it this way. No wonder they call Schlitz the beer that made Milwaukee famous. We love the halls of Ivy that surround us here today. Returning to the halls of Ivy, we find a moody and reflective Dr. Hall sitting on a bench on the commons with Mrs. Hall, who's feeding the squirrels. Mrs. Hall says... Look at the greedy little beggars. Would you like to give them some nuts? Hmm? Nuts. Oh, my sentiments exactly. <laughs> Vicky, you've no idea how inadequate I feel. I probably received more honorary degrees than Granger has third degrees. And yet, in certain spheres, he's an intellectual giant compared to me. He was cat and mousing me just now and enjoying it, too. How can I possibly give students the implements with which they can meet life on its own terms when I myself am so utterly helpless? Well, you might add some new courses to the curriculum. Cynicism 1 and 2. But that's a long-range problem. <laughs> Closer at hand is the question, how is the honest brakeman to be handled? And let's not try to be diplomatic about it. Oh, I agree. This calls for knuckle dusters rather than kid loves. Mm, what else? As I see it, the only thing Granger has that I lack is the control of one to 2,000 votes. 
And I doubt if I can supply this lack in the next few minutes. So that leaves only one alternative. Mm, change your name, grow a beard, and take up some other profession. Yes, something, something along those lines. Oh, this has turned out to be just about the most crisis-ridden stroll I've ever taken. <laughs> All I wanted to do this afternoon was to walk off an excellent lunch. So far, I've insulted the chairman of the board and been threatened with smear campaigns by a penny anti-politico. Well, life's full of little booby traps. Do you remember our reception at the Red Lion Inn at Marlow that last weekend in England? Oh, don't I? Now, now there was an infuriating quarter of an hour. <laughs> remember that wild dash to the railroad station? Yeah. After the last show, the bumpy train rides. No taxi to meet us when we arrived at two in the morning. Yeah, and a one-mile hike to the inn in the rain, <laughs> with you staggering under all that luggage. Yes, and not a soul awake at the hotel to take care of us when we got there. Oh, I'll never forget it, never. Where is everyone? Oh, the place is absolutely deserted. <laughs> oh, Vicky, now, don't tell me you've caught cold. Oh, no, I haven't. At least, I hope not. <laughs> so, sit, sit here, darling. Sit here, near the fire. I'll, I'll poke it up a bit. Well, how's he there's a note for us on the desk? Uh, I, I told the landlord when I telephoned that we were rather late getting here. He assured me someone would wait, wait up for us. Well, look. It's a box with my name on it. Is there? Well, 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 open it, darling. Look, bring it over here and sit down. There. Mm. Now give me your foot. I want to get those wet shoes off. Yeah. What's in it? It's a sack of flour. What on earth? Oh, good Lord. I told the landlord I wanted some flowers <laughs> for you. Flowers. <laughs> flowers. <laughs> you idiots. Uh, I'm sorry, darling. Well, please don't be. It was very sweet of you to have thought of it at all. Oh, I know. Much good it did. Oh, I'm going to knock at every door in the place till I find someone to look after us. No, Toddy, don't. There may be other couples here on a lovely weekend of their own. Well, I see no reason why they should be permitted to enjoy a weekend while we're condemned to a bench down here. Well, it's not so bad, really. Seems to be very soft wood. Oh, you're an angel, Vicky. <laughs> Always making the best of everything. Uh, sit down here. All right. Whoops! This is not soft wood. <laughs> Put your arms round me. I feel better already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, oh, it's too bad, isn't it? I'm sorry. Did I forestall a kiss? Oh, never mind, darling. I've plenty more. Look, <laughs> uh, you, you, um, uh, just, just tell me when. Now, there. Well, this is more like it. Ah, oh, Vicky, I'd planned it all so differently. I wanted our own comfortable room with a lovely fire going. A full moon outside the window and the smell of jasmine from the garden below. And somewhere a nightingale singing. It isn't really the season for nightingales. But then, then I would have hired someone to do bird calls just for the occasion. <laughs> I can coo a little. Ah, do a little, my dove. Coo? Oh, that was a sad little dove, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, darling, I'm sure of one thing. If we can surmount this kind of night, the rest of our married life ought to be smooth sailing. Then you're not beginning to lose the first fine full flush of enthusiasm. Lose it? Darling, you're soaked to the skin, your hair is all mussed up, your nose is red. And I have never seen anyone as ravishing. I love you, Vicky. And if it were ordained that we had to spend the rest of our lives sitting here feeling just as miserable, I'd say amen to it and enjoy every moment. Oh, Tony. Kiss me quickly before I sneeze. Before and immediately after, <laughs> my darling. But, but but let's move into this little sitting room. Why, why look, Victoria, isn't that amazing? What? Well, that motto over the door. It's exactly the same as the one at Ivy. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I know, Toddy. It's always been there. Oh, no, my dear, you don't understand. You've never seen it. It's over the library door at Ivy College in America. Well, of course it is. I'm sitting right here looking at it. Come. Back, Toddy, wherever you are. Come back. Looking at it. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Uh, you mean here at Ivy? I do wish I could go with you when you set sail into space like that. Oh, oh you, you do go with me, Vicky. Do you think I'd leave my first mate behind? Oh, that was <laughs> charming. <laughs> but I think we'd better head for home if you're going to upset Mr. Granger's wild and woolly plan. No, no, wait a moment. Wait, wait. I've just had an inspiration, Vicky. What? Seeing the library gave it to me. Let's go in. What 
What is it for? Well, in this library since 1640 has reposed the original charter of Ivy Township. When it was incorporated with 75 inhabitants, there must have been laws and statutes which were only intended to apply to a community that small. I'm going to snoop around and see if I can't hunt up some forgotten statute which might might legislate Mr. Granger smack out of his smug, complacent skin. Vicky, Vicky, I've got it. Tell, tell. Well, in 1757, when Ivy's population had swollen to 93 persons, the city fathers passed a law extending the vote on local affairs to anyone of voting age who had resided in the town for a minimum period of three months. No, you've lost me, my darling. I haven't got the faintest idea what you're talking about. Don't you realize that 1,500 Ivy students of voting age reside in this town for nine months every year? Doesn't that mean anything to you? Well, it makes for a very attractive campus. <laughs> yeah, but more attractive than you think. 1,500 votes will swing the entire balance of power in this town. Toddy, how wonderful! Well, this makes you a more powerful politico than Granger ever was. Of course it does. And when I explain the situation to the students, I'm sure they'll see eye to eye with and me. They'll go to the polls in droves. <laughs> you know, if it hadn't been for Professor Larson, I never would have thought to look up the law. Remind me, Vicky, to, to call her as soon as she returns from the meeting. I'm going to increase the budget for the political science department. Come along, Victoria. I'm ready for Mr. Granger. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. Don't be greedy, Tolly. Let me into the act, too. <laughs> of course. We'll, we'll cat and mouse him. Oh, oh, oh. Just watch Bus Hall in action. <laughs> be quiet, dear. He'll hear you. You're right on the nose, Doc. I was just about to turn on the ignition. <laughs> <laughs> what's so funny? <laughs> oh, yeah, I said, what's so funny? <laughs> you, you don't understand what's happening, and you're, and you're curious, aren't you? Yeah, quite right, quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me mad, Doc. I ask you a question. I expect an answer. Sure you do. You, you would. Quite right, quite right. <laughs> you both lost your minds? Oh, not at all. No, we're about to run you out of town and we're naturally pleased at the prospect. Nothing personal in it, you understand, just politics. Yeah, well, I'll give you ten seconds more, then I'll get mad. Quite right, quite right. <laughs> you have a big face every time I say that, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Granger, you noodle easy. What? Uh, needle, not noodle, darling. <laughs> Now, uh, pay close attention, honest Brickman. Yeah. I'm only going to say this once. Yeah. I've just completed a study of the laws of the town of Ivy. So what? You've made a small mistake. There's a forgotten but not obsolete statute here which renders more than 1,500 students at Ivy eligible to appear at the polls, eligible to take advantage of the statutes governing initiative, referendum, and recall. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Do you know the first thing we're going to do with our vote? We're going to build you a monument. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> a monument a thousand feet high, made of the rarest marble. Well, uh, I think possibly it'll be one inch wide. <laughs> it shouldn't cost more than a few million dollars. The college, of course, is non-taxable, so the property holders in town will have to pay for oh, it. Doc, listen. It's going to have your name plastered all over it, and each time they see it and think of the cost, they'll think of you. Fondly, devotedly. Oh, look, Doc. And that's only the oh, no, beginning. Doc, wait a minute. Then I think we'll reconstruct town hall so that the elevators remain stationary while the building goes up and down. <laughs> Doc, please, wait. Let's make a deal. A deal does not interest me. But there is always unconditional surrender. Yeah. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Ain't there? Uh, well, uh, you got it. Hey. Unconditional surrender. I'll do anything you say. The first thing you'll do is to come with me to a meeting of our board of governors and inform them the town council was mistaken in its resolution yesterday and that it will retract and apologize. <laughs> Quite right. I mean, uh, uh, sure. Hey, only a jerk would have believed it anyway. I want you to tell that to the chairman of our board personally. <laughs> personally? To Weldon? Yes, and in my presence. Doc, I got no right to ask, but will you do me a favor? Well, what is it? Do you teach politics here at Ivy? Yes, we have a political science department. I want to take that course. Enroll me. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. 
are here again, our Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Well, it's late, Toddy. Time to close up. Have you finished whatever it is that you're writing? No, but the last line, Vicky. It's a limerick. Hmm, perhaps I can help. How does it go? Uh, a guileless old fellow named Hall, on finding his back to the wall, like Machiavelli, he managed so well he... Uh, hmm. Could hardly be lived with at all. Oh, very good, my <laughs> But seriously, I think you handled the case of the honest brakeman very well. I don't know. I'm afraid I slipped up on the retort courteous. You went even one better, Toddy. You gave them the reproof valiant. Well, so long as it wasn't the reply churlish, my dear. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> We'll be seeing you next week at this time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Eleanor Audley, Edwin Max, and Herbert Butterfield. Tonight's script was written by Walter Brown Newman and Don Quinn. Our music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking. Oh, we love the Halls of Ivy that surround us here today, and we will not forget, though we be far, far away. Your tune for the stars on NBC. From 74 years ago, March 17, 1950, Ronald and Anita Coleman in the Halls of Ivy. Thanks again to Richard for buying us a copy over at ClassicRadio.stream to help support the podcast. Uh, coming up next, Art Linkletter and People Are Funny. Whenever you drive the car, there is always an unseen, unwelcome passenger with you. That passenger is danger. The danger of a traffic accident. Unfortunately, every person seems to have the absurd notion that he bears a charmed life, that no traffic accident can happen to him. But it can, and too often it does. So when you're behind that wheel, don't take chances. Obey all traffic rules. Drive safely for life, your life, and the lives of us. Now on this Sunday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we go back 71 years to March 17, 1953. Art Link Letters, People Are Funny. This is your last chance. Your last chance to make $1,000 cash on People Are Funny. <laughs> yes, thanks five from Hollywood, John Goodell's production of People Are Funny. Brought to you by Milky Way and Forever Yours Candy Bars, both quality bars made famous by Mars. And now, here is radio's top master of ceremonies, Art Linkletter. <laughs> Hello there. Sure and Begara, this is St. Patrick's Day, in honor of the good saint who drove the snakes out of Ireland. And you know where they came. And tonight we're going to drive some of them back out of Hollywood. <laughs> well, anyway, I hope the luck of the Irish is with all of you because this is the last week of our big $2,000 contest. Now, it's a $1,000 cash first prize or one of ten $100 cash prizes. We'll tell you how you win them a little later. Right now, Roy Rowan, who's first on the Milky Way show from Hollywood? Mrs. Lou Etta Nelson from Rockland, Idaho. Meet Art Linkletter. How do you do, Mrs. Nelson? How do you do? Mrs. Nelson, I'm going to guess about you. I'd say you've been married for uh, eight years. No. How many? Six. And I'd say you have two children. Yes. A boy and a girl. Yes. Boy five and a girl three. No. Boy four and a girl three. Well, that wasn't bad for guessing. And uh, Mrs. Nelson, I'm going to guess some more. If your husband's an average uh, husband, he likes uh, steak, potatoes, and apple pie. Good. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And you, you cook for him? Yes. Mm-hmm. And when you do serve him dinner and cook dinner... He raves every night about the food and the service. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Sounds like they've been married longer than that. Well, doesn't he ever leave you a tip on the dinner table? No, he does not. Well, I tell you, he sounds like the average American husband. And you sound like the average American wife who's a little tired of it all. And how would you like to have it all changed and get flattered and even paid for the work you do at the dinner table? That would be wonderful. That's good, because for the next 20 minutes, you're going to be a waitress at Mike Lyman's restaurant here in Hollywood. <laughs> yes, that's true. 
Mike Lyman's famous restaurant is up here in the heart of Hollywood, and we, where's the uniform, fellas? Bring it out here. Have you ever ever done any work as a waitress? Ever waited on anybody? No. Never had any experience like this? No. Well, when you volunteered, you were ready for anything, weren't you? Yeah. All right. Now, did you have you ever been to New York City? No. But did you ever hear of a, of a restaurant there where the waiters and waitresses, it's a big gag, you know, they insult the customers? No. Well, uh, it's a very famous place and proves that people are funny. They go someplace to be insulted. Did you know there was a restaurant like that right here in Hollywood? No, I didn't. Well, there wasn't until tonight. <laughs> You're going to start it. Tonight, your job is to, is to be a waitress and go from table to table. You'll be assigned one by the manager up there, Max Lerner. Now, you're going to go up there and try to insult every customer you wait on. Now, now just try it out. For instance, supposing that I was a customer up there and I said, Lady, uh, would you mind waiting on me? What would you say? Don't get your shirt off. <laughs> Don't get your shirt off. a new kind of an insult. Well, that's all right, but I want you to know this is a very respectable uh, restaurant, no? <laughs> Both the eyes whistled at you and said, how about some more butter? What would you say? Don't be a hog. That's all right, that's all right. Just be as insulting as you can, any way you want. But if you serve soup at all, be sure you know that the thumb is in the soup as you bring it in. <laughs> if there's a glass of water, they always start with that. Have a few crumbs floating around on it. <laughs> If anybody complains, tell them to keep quiet or everybody will want them. <laughs> now, the manager, the manager knows you're coming over. The other waiters and waitresses do not know, but just the manager, so you can't be fired. Now, no matter what anybody wants to eat, no matter what they order, you push pickled pig's feet. <laughs> and here is one last thing. Uh, at this time of the evening, there are bound to be some men dining alone over there. So you pick out a middle-aged one and walk up, stand by him for a minute, Mrs. Nelson, and uh, maybe ask him what he wants for dinner. And then you stop and you stand back and you put your hands on your hips and you say, I've told you a dozen times I won't go out with you. You're a married man. <laughs> what do you think this guy will do, huh? I don't know. Well, we'll find out. Now, now of course... This is, this is the part that protects you, Mrs. Nelson. We are not going to get you in trouble because he'll pretend to get mad because actually he's going to be an actor we hired because we want to find out the reactions of the people around him. Irv Atkins, you drive her up to Lyman's. And remember, the only person on the gag is Max Lerner, the manager, and he'll put you right to work as a waitress. So, on your way, say goodbye to Sour Puss Sally. There she goes. Oh, a little girl from Idaho is going to have a lot of fun. Huh? Of course, uh, we told her everything. She doesn't need to know one little tiny insignificant detail. <laughs> we don't have any actor over there. <laughs> no use doing it the easy way. Atkins will just point out some poor unsuspecting character sitting there. We should worry. We have lots of contestants. <laughs> All right, Roy, who's the third $1,000 grand prize winner in our funny experience contest? Art, the lucky winner is Gualterio Quinones from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And the 10 $100 prize winners have been notified by mail. Well, there are 11 lucky people, and you too can be lucky. Now, folks, this is your last chance. That's so right. This is positively... The last week, you can pick up one of Milky Way's hundred or thousand dollar cash prizes that we've been giving out every week for funny stories from you. So, come on, get in while the getting is good. Simply write us in 50 words or less on the subject, The Funniest Thing That Ever Happened to Me. Put your name and address on your entry, enclose two Milky Way or Forever Yours candy bar wrappers, or one of each, and mail to Milky Way, Box 224, Hollywood, California. Send all the entries you like, so long as your name and address and the two candy bar wrappers are with each. But your entry must be postmarked before midnight this Saturday, March 21st, or you'll be out of the running. It will be judged on the basis of originality, humor, and interest of the situation. Judges' decisions are final. All entries become the property of Mars Incorporated and none will be returned. The contest is subject to all federal, state, and local regulations. Don't forget, we're announcing the $1,000 prize winner's name on People Are Funny, April 7th. Is that you? Well, maybe something funny happened to you. 
Send it to Milky Way, Box 224, Hollywood, California. Last call. Who's next, Roy? Mr. George Dolly from Los Angeles. Meet Art Linkletter. Hello, Mr. Dolly. Mr. Dolly, what do you do for a living? Well, I work for Midland Properties Construction Company. I'd say you're a man of 35? Pretty close, 33. 33? Married for um, seven years? 12 years. 12 years, uh huh? Five children? No one. What do you do at the Midland Properties Construction Company? Oh, I work as a clerk in their office. Uh huh. That's the outfit, ladies and gentlemen, we sent a lot of tickets to. Uh, you have some people here with you from. Yes, I do. Is your boss here with you, Mr. Dolly? Well, he just happens to be, yes. Yeah. Oh, he came along with the rest of the workers. Yeah. What's his name? Mr. Lushing. Is he a nice boss? Mm, very nice. Very nice, huh? You said that so easy, I don't know. Is he nice? Have you ever have you given, given it a lot of thought? Yes, matter of fact, I have. He's a very nice man. Uh-huh. Did he give you a month's vacation, I suppose, with double pay every year? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Does he? <laughs> Why, sure. <laughs> he is a nice boss. <laughs> Does he give you a hundred dollar raise every six months? No, no, not exactly. Does he share the profits at all? Uh, no. <laughs> he isn't so nice as we made out at the start. <laughs> of course, you do call him a nice boss. What's his yes, name? Alfred Lushing. Alfred Lushing. Now, the reason I ask that is that while while we sent out tickets to the whole group and asked him to come along, he doesn't know that we're asking him up here right now. Mr. Lushing, the boss of the construction company. Would you come up? Come on. That's it. Give him a little encouragement. <laughs> Mr. Lushing, would you come right over here, please? Uh, you know Mr. Dolly? Yes, I do. How long has yes. he worked for you? Oh, about uh, six years, isn't it, George? Oh, about seven now. Seven. Seven years. Let's not cut his service down. You know, he's going for that gold watch. <laughs> now, Mr. Dolly, uh, what's your first name? George. George Dolly. When employees get together, you know, uh, during off hours, they sometimes talk about their boss, don't they? Well, sometimes. Yes, of course they do. All, all employees do. They don't say anything uncomplimentary. Maybe some will say, gee, if I wasn't smarter than him, I'd drop dead. <laughs> Have you ever said anything like that? No, no. <laughs> but deep down in your heart, what do you honestly think? <laughs> I, think he's a, I think he's a very smart man. You think he's a very smart man, uh-huh. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Lushing, you do look like a smart man. If you don't mind, I'm going to give you a quick intelligence test devised by Professor Terman of Stanford University. If the sun rises in the east, where does it set? In the west. Right. The world is flat as a pancake. True or false? False. If it's, watch this one. If it's 3 o'clock in New York and 12 o'clock in Los Angeles, what time is it in west Los Angeles? 12 o'clock. He passed. <laughs> Mr. Dolly, you do have a smart boss, don't you? Oh, without a doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, in front of the public, from coast to coast, we want to see the reactions of an employee and an employer when they are an intelligence test against each other. We're going to settle once and for all who is smarter, the employee or the employer. <laughs> don't you think that's a good idea, Mr. Dolly? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Now, look, I'm sure your boss, Mr. Lushing, wouldn't mind if, if you beat him. Would you, Mr. Lushing? Oh, no. No, I think he should do his best. Well, Mr. Dolly versus his boss, Mr. Lushing. And I'm going to start with you, Mr. Dolly. I'll answer these to the best of your ability, both of you. Who is Secretary of State? John he- Foster Dulles. Now, before I even could say in Eisenhower's cabinet, that's right, John Foster Dulles. Now to the boss, Mr. Lushing. Who's Secretary of the Navy? In 1798. <laughs> I'm sorry, time's up. It was Benjamin Stoddard, as everybody knows. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dolly, which of these figures is closest to the jet plane speed record? 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, or 500 miles an hour? 500 miles an hour. And now, Mr. Lushy, to be fair, I'll give you the same type of question. <laughs> <laughs> what is the maximum speed of a year-old bumblebee with a 20-mile tail? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going to give him a hint. This is a female bumblebee. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. Shouldn't he have known that, Mr. Dolly? Well, I don't think that's a fair question. <laughs> You're being modest, that's all. <laughs> Why don't you admit it? Now, Mr. Dolly, what is Harry Truman's daughter famous for? What is she? It begins with S. Skating. <laughs> You know, that's absolutely right. <laughs> Harry, the Harry Truman I'm thinking of runs a small shoemaker shop up near Lake Schenectady. 
and his daughter is an ice skater. <laughs> it's correct. Mr. Lushing, the boss, what is President Eisenhower's wife's name? Mamie. I'm going to have to count that wrong. It's just half right. It's Mamie Eisenhower. <laughs> Mr. Dolly, your boss could miss him, can't he? Well, I, I don't think that was fair either. <laughs> well, don't stick up for him. You're trying to lose this contest. Your next question. If I had two pets and you gave me two more next week, at the end of next week, how many would I have? Twelve. Uh, <laughs> you're right, they're rabbits. <laughs> If you'd have said one, they'd have died. <laughs> well, there's no use carrying this contest any further. It's kind of one-sided. What's the final score, Mr. Goodell? Mr. Lushing, all wrong. Mr. Dolly, all right. <laughs> well, we've settled. Who's smarter? Aren't you thrilled, Mr. Dolly? Mm, I guess so, yes. Yes, well, you ought to be. And Mr. Lushing, how do you feel about it? Well, I think it's very good. The boys have to carry on the business. <laughs> In other words, you want smart employees. That I do. Yeah, you have to do less then. Quite. Uh, that's a mighty sound observation. Now, would you two men accept any prize we might offer as a reward for being here tonight? Mm -hmm. All yes, right. Yes. We're going to give the boss a day off from work next week. Mr. Lushing and Mr. Dolly, for your prize, you must have, you've agreed to this. Yeah. Mr. Dolly will take over the job as the president of the Midland Properties Construction Company. <laughs> Won't that be fun? <laughs> George? Well, yes, it certainly will. I don't think I'll be able to do as well as he does, though. Oh, now, you don't need to say that. You can build the houses with a different slant the day he's gone. <laughs> and just to make it more fun as the boss, Mr. Dawley, while you're in the office there, when you get home, you'll find there a 21-inch console model Westinghouse television set. Whoa. You can be sure if it's a Westinghouse. How does that sound? Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Mr. Lushing, you have a day off to give you something to read in your day off. Here's a copy of the Bobsy Twins at Cherry Farm. A lovely book. <laughs> Goodbye and thanks to both of you from Milky Way. And don't forget to brighten your day with Milky Way. Say, Roy, do you feel a draft somewhere? Well, no, Art, that's our saxophone player. Blowing in for the fourth week. Dr. Richard Nelson with his wife and famous teacher, Freddie Martin. Hi, folks. Hello, Hello, Doctor. Hi, Art. Mrs. Nelson. Hello. Freddie Martin, from being one of the world's most famous band leaders, you have now been a music teacher for the last three weeks, trying to teach a young musician, Dr. Nelson, who has never before studied any music at all, how to play the saxophone. Mm -hmm. How do you like it? Well, Art, uh, I'm seriously considering shipping out on a live bait barge to Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a harrowing experience. And Dr. Nelson, you, you don't seem to be his favorite pupil. What's the trouble? Well, I wouldn't say he was my favorite teacher either. <laughs> After three weeks, how do you like him as a critic? After all, he's been the judge of your music each week. Well, as a critic, I, I'm just waiting to get a chance to operate on him. <laughs> <laughs> you see the reason Dr. Nelson feels this way? We picked him out of the audience, oh, three weeks ago. As a man who never studied music, and we gave him a saxophone, and Freddie Martin. And after a week of practicing the Stein song, Freddie Martin had to judge whether he could play it well enough or not to get a vacation trip to New England. I remember you turned thumbs down, didn't you, Freddie? Yes, I had to. Yeah. From a professional standpoint, I hated to do it, aren't I? Oh, naturally. You know. So we gave him a second week to try, and the doc tried to learn the sidewalks in New York for a trip to New York City. And, Doctor, do you remember what Freddie thought of your rendition of that song? Well... I, it went pretty good, except the last note is sure flubbed up. <laughs> Flub is a fine word. You cracked the sidewalks in New York. <laughs> anyway, tonight, you've come back for the third week, and we're giving you another chance. Now, if you can play the tune Chicago, to Freddie's satisfaction, Milky Way will send you and Mrs. Nelson on an all-expense-paid vacation to the Windy City. What do you think of that? Well, that's fine, but it's, doesn't it seem like every week the trip gets near home? <laughs> Does, does. <laughs> you still want to go to Chicago, don't you? Oh, sure. All right, you've been practicing? Yes. I, been, I remember Dr. Nelson gets home from the hospital about 11 o'clock at night. It's the only time he has to practice. 
So, Doc Nelson, you are now going to try to play Chicago. And if you play it well enough, away you go. Let's hear it. Here we go. is located in Chicago, and if you have just ruined the next batch of Milky Ways, we're going to sue you. <laughs> Freddie Martin, you're a perfectionist on a saxophone, perhaps one of the great saxophone players of the world. What would you say uh, as to whether or not he's playing it well enough? Well, Art, his embouchure is still very immature. He's playing for the two in Chicago. That was a little on the legato side. Too much rubato, I'm afraid, Doctor. Um... Sounds bad. I don't know what you're saying. But well, does, does, does he go to Chicago or not? I'm afraid. I, I just I hate to do this, but I'm afraid I couldn't say yes to that. <laughs> well, Doctor, you have worked hard now for three weeks, and I think you do deserve some kind of a prize. I'm going to give you one more chance. You believe me, don't you, Doctor? Frankly, no. <laughs> Ooh, too many times no, already. No. You've been a mighty good sport, and we're going to do this. In a hat that's being brought out right now are a number of songs and names of songs. Now, if you can play just the first note, only the first note of any of the songs in that hat, Milky Way will give you and Mrs. Nelson a wonderful vacation at the place mentioned in the title of the song. Oh, by the way, you don't read music, of course, so, uh, Freddie... Uh, he couldn't be expected to read the first note, so you just uh, draw in the hat. Just reach in there and grab one out and tell him what the first note is. Uh, B flat. B flat. Now, Dr. Nelson, here's your chance. You play B flat, and Mrs. Nelson and you go to the place mentioned in the title. So play B flat and really make that sharp. What do you say, Freddie? That's the most beautiful B flat I ever heard in my life. <laughs> He had to pick out a B flat. You mean to say that his 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 embouchure is not immature? No, sir. <laughs> and it's right on the nose. His, his legato is not tacit. <laughs> After all of these weeks, I, it's a pleasure now to hear that tone come out of there. That was beautiful. You they get the trick. The right note. Absolutely. And uh, by the way, you have the, the slip there. What is the name of the song you picked? Uh, San Fernando Valley. <laughs> well, for God's sake, that's, that's wonderful. Now, that's Mr. Nelson, you and Mrs. Nelson will be flown on a TWA 300 mile an hour Transworld Airline Constellation from Los Angeles to San Fernando Valley. And while that is only a six mile trip by air, you do get a wonderful eight mile bus trip to the airport. <laughs> Uh, you're going to vacation at uh, uh, a little motel. There's the telephone. Just a minute. Hello. Hello. Yes, this is Art Linkletter. Mm -hmm. Yes, the people are funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was TWA on the phone. Their planes, unfortunately, according to the schedule, do not land in San Fernando Valley. So once you get aboard, they will have to take you on across the United States to New York City. How do you oh, like that, Mr. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Like that. Oh, that's really good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There goes the phone again. Yes, yes. This is Link Letter again. Uh huh. Yes. Oh yes. Thank you. Oh, oh, it does. Well, okay. I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Fine. Goodbye. What do you know? Something's happened again. Oh, boy. Well, nice Nelson? thinking about it anyway. Huh? Nice thinking about it anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that plane schedule doesn't happen to stop in New York long enough for you to get your luggage off, and you'll have to go on across the Atlantic Ocean to Paris, France. Oh. Isn't that nice? Yes, sir. 
You'll go all the way across yeah. to Paris with all expenses paid, and you'll stay at the famous Georges Saint Hotel. That's George oh. V. Oh. That's where I stayed in Paris. You'll get a bigger room, though. <laughs> you'll be near the Arc de Triomphe. You'll be on the Champs d'Elysees. Oh, it'll be wonderful. And you'll really deserve it after these four weeks. And have a wonderful time. Do you speak French? No, but do they understand the saxophone? <laughs> I would suggest, Doctor, that you leave the sax at home. The United States is having enough trouble with international harmony. As a matter of fact, uh, Freddie Martin, what are you so happy about? Well, the uh, teacher always goes with a pupil, you know, Art. Oh, he does, huh? Yeah, naturally. As a matter of fact, Freddie, I know you're kidding me, but as a big surprise to you, we have already made arrangements, and we have your ticket to Paris. Yes, the Paris Inn, right here in downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, boy. By the way, uh, Dr. Nelson, are you glad that you came along for the trip? Oh, boy, it's been worth every minute. Those midnight hours I spent practicing. <laughs> I can't think of anybody I'd, I'd, I'd like and enjoy more giving a wonderful prize to than a young resident doctor doing his part for everybody. So, goodbye from all of us and a happy vacation oh, from oh. Milky Way... Forever yours and Freddie Martin, your dear friend. <laughs> Say, before I forget, don't you forget, this is positively the last week you can pick up one of those big cash prizes in Milky Way's Funny Story Contest. And please make sure the two Milky Way or Forever Yours candy bar wrappers are with each entry. Of course, that should be easy enough. You'll be eating the bars before you send the wrappers. And believe me, your taste never had it so good. Your taste, mind you, because if you have that taste for light, pure milk chocolate, you simply concentrate on Milky Way, the finest of finest light, pure milk chocolate wrapped around chocolate and malted milk nougat and a creamy caramel layer. Yes, sir, it's great. On the other hand, folks, if you like dark chocolate better, you'll never get a better answer than when you ask for Milky Way's first cousin... The Mars Forever Yours Bar. There's dark vanilla-flavored chocolate, a king-sized coating of it, and inside, vanilla nougat plus that famous creamy Mars Golden Caramel Layer. Milky Way, Forever Yours. Cousins in good taste, for your taste. Will you join me? At the beginning of the program, we sent a, a lady out to the middle of Hollywood to pretend she was a waitress at Mike Lyman's restaurant. Remember, she was dressed up as one. The manager was in on the gag. Her name was Mrs. Lou Etta Nelson, and she was supposed to insult the customers in that restaurant, especially one middle-aged customer who we told her was to be pointed out to her as an actor, and she was to accuse him out loud of trying to date her up. Of course, what she didn't know was that we had no actor up there. It was some stranger. We don't know who it was or what happened. So Mrs. Nelson's in the hall. Open the door, boys. Bring her in, and let's find out what happened to a tourist in Hollywood who got caught in the People Are Funny web. You went up to Mike Lyman's. Were there yes. many people there at this time? Yeah, it was crowded. Uh -huh. Now, the manager was in on it, and he assigned you some tables. Uh-huh. Now, what did your first customer order? Do you remember? He ordered the dinner. The regular Complete dinner? dinner, uh -huh. Now, what did you say? I asked, told him that he would enjoy the pickled pig feet. Now, what did he say to that? And he said, no, I'd rather have the roast beef. And I said, oh, it's done to perfection. You will really enjoy it tonight. It's excellent. The pickled pig's feet? Mm -hmm. But uh, did you insult anybody? How did you insult them? Well, I uh, poured water for a, a table there of four, and I got some crumbs mixed in with it. Were you very flip in your remarks with the... With the I customer? tried to be. Did you insult any of them? Well, they looked insulted. <laughs> Did anybody give you any tips? No. Now, Irv Atkins pointed out a, uh, some middle-aged man who was an actor up there. Yes. And you walked over to him. Mm -hmm. What'd you do then? What'd you say? I put my hands on my hips and I said, Now, listen, I'm not going to have a date with you. You're already married. Huh? <laughs> he looked at me and he says, Well, I didn't ask you for a date. And did any of the other people around hear this? Yes, everybody was looking at me. He denied it, and but he got awfully riled up and mad and... And he was speaking so loud. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, did anybody get mad at all? Well, they were provoked, yes. Uh -huh. Would you say, generally speaking, that the average American public will stand for more than you thought it would stand for or not? No, they want to be served properly, I'm quite sure. Uh -huh. And uh, are you interested in meeting this uh, gray-haired old man, this actor? <laughs> I don't know. I guess so. <laughs> we don't know who he is. He's no actor. In fact, we hope we'll never see him again. 
This, wasn't that terrible? We, our actor failed to show up, and so we just told her if to point out anybody to you. <laughs> terrible mistake. <laughs> well, Mrs. Nelson, you, uh, you were the victim of a little hoax, as usual, on this program, and also you performed a little experiment, which I hope will lead you to be happier at home with your husband, even though he is not being an average American husband, as prolific in his praise of you as you'd like. Are you going to be happy to serve at home for a while again? I certainly shall. <laughs> you go back to that little town in Idaho and glad to be there. And after coming here and doing such a good job, we'd like to have you take home with you a world-famous $350 Adler sewing machine in the Windsor desk model. Isn't that nice? Oh, thank you very your much. choice of blonde or walnut finishes, it'll be wonderful for your home and for your children. And thanks for Milky Way. Thank Goodbye, you. Mrs. Nelson. Oh, uh, yeah. No, next week on People Are Funny, we're going to try to get a man to fly without a plane, without a parachute. Will he do it? Tune in and find out. And now this is Art Linkletter saying good night for Milky Way and reminding you that you have only four more days to send in that funny experience for a chance at that grand prize of $1,000 cash or one of $1,000 prizes. Now, remember, the contest officially closes this Saturday, March 21st. But you still have time, so write your funny experience in 50 words or less. Mail with two wrappers from Milky Way or forever yours, candy bars, to Milky Way, Box 2, 2, 4, Hollywood, California. Do it now. Good night, folks. See you next Tuesday. People Are Funny is brought to you by Milky Way, America's biggest-selling chocolate-covered candy bar, and by Milky Way's first cousin, that dark chocolate-covered favorite forever yours. Remember, when your taste tells you light, pure milk chocolate over chocolate malted milk nougat, ask for Milky Way. But when dark chocolate is your wish, forever yours is your dish. Milky Way, forever yours. Both quality candy bars made famous by Mars. This program was transcribed from Hollywood. From 71 years ago, March 17th, 1953, Art Link Letters, People Are Funny, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Tomorrow, Casey Crime Photographer, Dangerous Assignment. I was a communist with the FBI, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and the Weird Circle. But right now, we head to Pine Ridge, Arkansas, to see what's going on at the Jotham Down store with Lum and Abner. There's a price tag on almost everything. Whether you drive a shiny new 1952 model or a pre-war jalopy, you had to pay the price. And when you're driving that car, remember that speed also has its price. The price tag on speed violations last year was 15,000 killed and 500,000 injured. This year, thousands of lives can be saved if you and millions of other motorists come to the sober realization that speed is the biggest killer on the highways and resolve to slow down before you or someone else pays the price that must be paid for it. You can do your part by keeping within speed limits. At all times, drive as though your life depends on it. It does. And now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, let's go to the Jot em Down store and visit with Lum and Abner and see what the latest is going on with Diogenes and the Lamp. This episode was originally broadcast March 17th, 1942. The makers of Alka-Seltzer bring you Lum and Abner. <laughs> Hey, folks, do you enjoy giving friendly advice to your friends? Well, Lum and Abner do, and they have a helpful suggestion for, for all of you radio friends. They want you to know about the genuine relief that Alka-Seltzer offers for minor stomach upsets. Honestly, folks, you have no idea what a splendid idea that is until you take Alka-Seltzer and see what prompt relief 
and what pleasant relief it brings for a touch of acid indigestion, sour upset stomach, and occasional distress after meals. You see, Alka-Seltzer does more than reduce excess gastric acidity. It also helps to relieve that uncomfortable fullness and ease the discomfort of an upset jittery stomach. No wonder that countless thousands of folks always keep a package of these modern effervescent tablets in their home and at their place of work. And I'm sure you'll want to do the same once you've tried Alka-Seltzer. So don't put it off. Ask your druggist for Alka-Seltzer. The sooner the better. He has it by the package and also serves it by the glass at his soda fountain. And now, let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. Well, mysterious things are happening these days. Diogenes Smith has failed to return to Pine Ridge when he said he would. The stranger, Mr. Adams, is still in town asking Cedric a lot of questions, and Lum and Abner are still trying to solve the mystery of Cedric's sudden wealth. As we look in on the little community today, we find Abner in the Jotham Down store and library attempting to get some information from Cedric. Listen. Oh, come on now, please, Cedric. Now, now tell me, wh wh where are you getting all this money? Well, I ain't going to tell, Mr. Abner. I I've got magic power, I think. Yeah, well, uh, how, how do you work a magic power? Oh. <laughs> now, don't just stand there and giggle, Cedric. Now, tell me. <laughs> How you gonna do it? Hey, Doggy, you're the exasperatingest one boy I ever knowed in my life. You ought to respect your elders, Cedric, and tell them what they ask you. Well, I, I ain't telling nothing. Listen, Cedric, if you let me in on your secret, I'll give you anything you want. I've already got everything I want ordered from the mail order house. <laughs> uh, if there's anything else I want, I've got enough money to buy it, too. Yeah, that's right, ain't it? Cedric, uh, do you recollect when you was a young un and, and you had a broke arm and, and I come over and set up with you? Oh, that was Mr. Lum that done that. Oh. Uh, well, it was my idea, though, I think. I, I was the one that told him to do it. I might not sure I was. And I, I sent you over a whole big sack of gumdrops, too, I think. Oh, I know what you're trying to do. <laughs> you're, you're just trying to get me to tell my magic secret, but I ain't going to do it. Mm, doggy, Cedric ain't there nothing in this world you want that you can't buy with money? No, Mom, there ain't not a thing. Well, except two things. Two things? Yes, Mom. I, I want to be called Mr. Wee Hunt, and, and I want to beat that pinball machine down at Mr. Luke's place just once. Beat the pinball machine. Just one time, that's all. Just one time. Hey, doggy, Cedric, I believe I can arrange that for you. Can you, sure enough, can you? Huh? Why, sure, sure, enough. sure. I'll just call up Luke and, er, uh, well, I can't tell you how it's did, Cedric. It's sort of magic stuff, too, I think. But yes, sir. I, I can do it for you, Cedric, er, uh, Mr. Weehunt. Well, come on, I'll show you my magic secret. Yeah, well, wait, wait, Mr. Weehunt. Can't you show me here? I can't leave the store. No, Mom, I can't show you here. We gotta go to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. There comes Lum up out there. Oh, oh Mr. Lum. Well, I reckon I can't show you now, then. I don't want to let everybody in town find out my secret. Why, of course not. I don't want him to find it out, neither. I want to be the one to first discover it. Well... Maybe I'll show you tomorrow, or the next day, or sometime. No, sir, now you can do it today. Well, here, now that Lum's back, why, I can study up some reason to leave, Cedric. That's what I'll do. I'll figure out, mind out, mind out. Here it comes quiet. Well, when, when are we going down and play the pinball machine? Well, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Just don't say nothing. Wonderful no. world, Mr. Lum. Wonderful world, Lum. Yeah, wonderful world. Say, Cedric, has that feller Adams been in to see you again today? No, Mom, he ain't. What did he want to see you about yesterday? Oh, I don't know. I forget now. Nothing important, I don't think, though. Uh, say, Lum, uh, will you watch the store for a little while? Uh, me and Mr. Weehunt here's got to, well, uh, we got to go someplace. You and Mr. Weehunt? Yeah. What business you got with Cedric's Paul? Well, it ain't my papa. It's me. <laughs> That's what I'm being called now, Mr. Weehunt. Yeah. Oh, I see. Since you're a partner in the store, huh? <laughs> Big business executive. Yes, Mom. Since I'm rich, too. Well, where is it you two's got to go with that same importance? Oh, we just got to, uh, uh, got, got, got to go to lunch. Lunch? Yeah, that's it. Lunch. Got to go. Got to go. Well, it ain't time for that yet. Just a little after 10.30. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm awful hungry today, Lom. Awful hungry. See, I forgot to eat breakfast this morning. <laughs> forgot to eat supper last night, too, I think. 
Hey, this is the first time I ever hear of you for getting a meal. <laughs> well, I'm getting awful absent-minded here, lady. <laughs> uh, let's see now, what's your name? What's my name? Yeah. Well, I'm Edwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot who you are. For goodness <laughs> sakes, you are getting bad. Oh, the worst I ever seen in my life. Warren Elizabeth half to death. Oh, I'm just awful. Can't recollect oh, nothing. Well, you can go to lunch, but hurry back and don't expect to go out and eat again at noon. Oh, no, I won't, I won't. Come on, Mr. Weehunt, let's go. A small, wonderful world, Mr. Long. A yeah, wonderful world, Cedric. Er, Mr. Weehunt. A yeah, wonderful world, Long. Come on, Mr. Weehunt. Hurry up now. Where do we go now? Just follow with me, Mr. Abner. Right out here. Oh. <laughs> Cedric, did you notice how smart I was to figure out a way to get out of the store without Lum getting suspicious? Yes, yeah, Lum. <laughs> it sure was fooled, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Good for me for being so smart. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What are we going around back of the store for? Because that's where my secret's at around here. Oh. Though you ain't got all that money buried back here, have you? No, Mom. No, I ain't got it buried no place. Well, where are you getting it then, Cedric? Oh, you'll see. Let me see now. Where's them keys? Keys? Yeah. What there. keys? Here they are. What's them? You saw these keys before, Mr. Abner. Huh? That ain't my keys, are they? No, Mom. They're, they're the ones Dodge and he's left in my car the day I taken him into the county seat to catch the train. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I recollect them now. What, you oughtn't to be carrying them around with you, Cedric. You ought to keep them someplace for Dodge, and he's your liable to lose them carrying them around in your pocket this way. Well, I have to carry them around so that I can unlock the back door to the feed room. Feed room? Yes, Ma. All right, doggy Cedric, you ain't supposed to go in there. That was the last thing that Dodge and he's told me and Lum before he left town. He says, don't go into that workshop of mine back there. That's what he said. Well, he never told me that. He told me I was supposed to carry on his work for him and spread the word of kind and honest into all the corners it's dark or something like that. Well, yeah, I know he told you that, Cedric, but he, he never meant for you to go into that feed room. Oh, well, yes, Mom, I think he did. I believe that's why he left the keys in my car, so oh. I could go in and print up some pamphlets and spread the word around. Is that where you're getting your money? From them pamphlets? Well, <laughs> sort of. Well, I do know. I thought everything but that. Well, I never figured you could sell them things for that much money. I know I wouldn't pay much for them. Well, whilst there's some awful good teaching in them about right living and all such as that, but I don't see who you could sell enough pamphlets to to make all the money you've been carrying around, Cedric. <laughs> Here's the door. Do you want to go in or don't you? Well, yeah, sure. Sure, of course I want to. I just... Hope Dodge and he don't come back to town and catch us, that's all I hope. Oh, I don't think he will, hardly. Besides, he wouldn't care if I was in here no way, I don't think. Well, I hope not. Dog, this is kind of scary, though. It's just like breaking in someplace. Well, go ahead, unlock the door, Cedric. Yes, Mom, I'm already doing it. I sort of wish Lum was here. Reckon I ought to go get him. Here, come on, let's go in. Huh? Come on, Mr. Abner. Well, well, here... Uh, uh, you, you go first, Cedric. All right, I ain't scared. <laughs> Nothing to be scared of in here. Doggies. Sort of dark in here, ain't it? Yeah, well, wait a minute, let me close the door here. Oh, yeah, yeah, close the door before somebody sees us in here, Cedric. Now then. Hmm. Huh. Reckon why Dodge and he's got the windows all boarded up this way. Well, he never want nobody to watch him, I reckon. Yeah. Wait a minute, and I'll turn on the light. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Hell. Well, <laughs> it's sort of cozy in here, you know. Oh, it's all fixed up. Oh, me and Lum fixed this old feed room up comfort for Diogenes, you know. It's so like we... a setting room in here. Well, we brung down all the furniture from Lum's place and mine, too, might now. I'm sure I'd almost forgot what it looked like in here. Ain't been back here for so long. <laughs> no, Lum. I just keep it this way. Be a good place to come back here and rest in the afternoon. Yes, sleep. Well, come on, Cedric. Now, now, hurry up and show me your magic power now. Well, now, wait a minute. Before we go any further, you won't tell nobody else about this, will you, Mr. Abner? Cedric, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred thousand times, I ain't going to breathe it to a soul. I'll keep a secret. Honest, I will, Cedric. Cross your heart. Cross my heart. I'll even double cross it. Now, come on, now. Show me, show me. I'm just dying to see it. <laughs> all right. Now, you see, here's the printing press where Dodge and these prints up all them pamphlets, ain't it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, it must be. I ain't never saw him do it, but I saw the pamphlets a thousand or a hundred times. Well, now, you watch what happens whenever I print some pamphlets. 
Now, look, wait a minute. Let me get some paper in there. Now, I'm looking. Now. Now, go ahead. Show me. <laughs> that works easy, don't it? Oh, yes. Sir. Wonder if I could run one of them things. There. Huh. Look what come out, Mr. Abner. <laughs> well, I do know. Cedric. Them's $10 bills. Yes, Mom. I don't know what I do, but I, I got magic power somewhere or other. When Mr. Dodge needs does it, he just gets pamphlets. But when I do it, they come out $10 bills every time. For the land sake. Let's, let's see you do that again now, Cedric. Yes, Mom. Wait a minute. Let me get some paper in there. Now, you watch me awful close this time. Maybe you can see what it is that I'm doing that's magic. I can't even tell myself. Yeah, I'll watch you. Go ahead. Well, I can't see nothing that looks magic. Well, there you are. Another sheet of $10 bills. All you got to do is take a pair of scissors and cut them out of there. <laughs> well, I swan to good. I never would have believed it if I hadn't have seen it with my own eyes. I wish I'd have known I could have done this earlier in life. I just wasted a lot of years, looks like. All right, Doggy Cedric, uh, let me try that thing once. All right, but I don't believe it'll work for you, Mr. Abner. I know it don't for Mr. Diogenes. You have to be magic like me. Yeah, well, I'd love to try it anyway. Maybe we can figure out what you do that's different from other folks. Now, let's see. How do I do it now, Cedric? Just wait a minute. Let me put some paper in there first. Yeah, yeah. Now, just pull that handle down there. That's all. But I know you'll just get pamphlets. Yeah, well, here it goes anyway. <laughs> that part's easy enough. Now, let's see. Oh, my goodness. Mom? Look, Cedric, look. Ten dollar bills. Well, I'll be. My doggies, I'm magic too. We're rich, Cedric. We're rich. You know, folks, we all take a lot of things for granted in this world, but not when we're buying the family vitamins. Then we want the facts, and here are the facts about our new one a day vitamin product, one a day brand vitamin B complex tablets. First of all, this new tablet differs from the one a day brand vitamin A and D tablets so many of you have been taking because this new tablet contains an entirely different group of vitamins, the vitamins of the B-complex. So now there are two kinds of one-a-day vitamin tablets, vitamin A and D tablets, and also vitamin B-complex tablets. Of course, most of you folks realize how very important are vitamins A and D. Well, keep this in mind. The vitamins of this new B-complex tablet are also very important to you because the body cannot get along and maintain its normal activity without enough of the B vitamins. Now, here's an easy and economical way to be sure you get an additional supply of both A and D, or cod liver oil vitamins, and those vitamins of the B complex known to be necessary to the activity and to the well-being of our bodies. Take both one-a-day brand vitamin products. It's easy and economical because, listen, one of each, just once a day, is all you take. Ask your druggist for both one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets in the yellow box and one-a-day vitamin B complex tablets in the gray box. Now be sure you get one-a-day brand. Look for that big one on each package. I don't think it's magic, and I think we know why the guy's poking around. From 82 years ago, uh, March 17th, 1942, Lemon Abner here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Tomorrow, Casey Crime Photographer, Dangerous Assignments. I was a communist for the FBI, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and the Weird Circle. Thank you so much for stopping by, and we will see you on Monday for more Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox.